Hello everyone, Xeno What If here. Bring in Season 2 Part 31 of What If The Transformers Were In My Hero Academia. Link in the description of the fanfiction of this What If. A. N. Listen here YouTube. I do not own anything and this is not a scam. Chapter 61. Sky Commander, Jetfire. Comma dot dot. So, what's your name, Fleshy? Izuku didn't answer right away. He was still reeling from the fact that he had essentially been plucked out of the sky, flown around in a high-speed aircraft like it was nothing and was still alive to tell the tale. And on top of all that, he was saved by the Autobots, second in command, who was probably the coolest Transformer ever created. I mean, his head looks like a Macross Mex, so he's already automatically cool by default. He thought to himself, only to get pulled from his mind by Jetfire lightly snapping his metallic fingers. Hey, hey, come on kid, don't zone out on me in the middle of a war zone, he encouraged. I need a name if I wanna work with ya. Oh oh, I'm sorry, Izuku bowed before introducing himself. My name is Izuku Midoriya. Thank you so much for saving me. With another snap of his fingers, Jetfire pointed to the boy with enthusiasm. Hey, now there's what I was looking for. He brought his hand closer in greeting. Put, er there, Zuku, buddy. Nice to meet ya. Oh geez, another nickname. Izuku stood up in Jetfire's hand and brought his own out, returning the gesture. As if I don't have enough already, all the same, he wasn't about to complain, especially to an Autobot as cool as this one. Why yeah, nice to meet you, too. So, what exactly are ya, anyway? I can't keep calling ya, fleshy, ya know. Ah, right, I'm a human, and you're on planet Earth. Whir, ah. Izuku let out a gasp and thrusted his hand up, pointing behind Jetfire's head. Incoming. Hold on. Jetfire whirled around in midair, narrowly avoiding the torpedo mini-cons. The duo let out a growl as they passed, which Jetfire took as an invitation to take aim and fire. Gah, you two again. Don't you have anything better to do than follow that idiot around? As if on cue, Skybite came surging up from below in his shark mode, his mouth wide open and ready to bite down. That idiot is underneath you. But even then, Jetfire was prepared, maneuvering around the Predacon and letting him bite on nothing but air. Skybite roared in rage and shouted, terrorize, taking to his robot mode once again. Seriously, why must you follow me everywhere I go? Jetfire's tone took on a lot more venom as he aimed his blaster at Skybite, keeping him locked in his sights. Why do you think, ya overgrown fish droid? Could it possibly be, oh, I don't know, the fact that you almost blew me up. Skybite rolled his optics. Oh, please, I've done far worse to other Autobots. You should have seen what I did to, bam, aha. Uh -huh. Stop, talking. Jetfire spat, the barrel of his blaster smoking after that near shot toward Skybite's head. That was your only warning shot. Now, you're gonna turn yourself in and we're gonna. Ahem. Jetfire was suddenly interrupted, prompting him to whirl around and see, Starscream, in probably the sorriest state possible. One of his wings was partially clipped, his armor was scorched and his face had a large, X-shaped scar in the center. And on top of all that, he was jittering around as green electricity sparked all across his joints, right down to his speech stuttering with every other word. HH hello, Jetfire, he said venomously. FF fancy seeing you HH here, old friend. Izuku's eye widened slightly. Old, friend, later. Jetfire said before he scanned his optics up and down the seeker, taking him in. Starscream, been a while. You look like hammered scrap. The air commander grimaced. I know. BB but even so, TH that will NN not stop me from finishing the JJ job that Skybite started so long ago. He raised one of his null rays to fire at him, only for the weapon to spark and blow up on his arm, making him holler in pain. GYAAAH. Oh. Oh dear Primus, why? Jetfire and Izuku shared an awkward glance, both turning to Skybite who was also wincing at the sight. Err, Commander, I once again recommend you return to base. The Predacon recommended. See Flatline and I will see to it that. No. The Seeker snapped, readying his hands to grapple with Jetfire. I will take him hand to hand if I have to. Graw, but Jetfire just casually flew out of his way, Starscream's own thrusters only sputtering at that point. And on top of that, Jetfire took the opportunity to kick him right in the knee. Clang. Ah. 
It was all Starscream could do to keep himself airborne as he clutched his leg, seething with pain and rage. Listen, Screamer, I'd like to have a little reunion with ya, but it's obvious that you're not up to it right now. Jetfire nudged his head out toward the horizon. And hey, backup's coming for ya anyway. W what? Starscream craned his head around and was met with his brother closing in on them, much to his surprise. Th Thundercracker, what are you doing here? With the Cybercolliber in hand, Thundercracker saluted and replied, Starscream, we've got several injured, and I'm not talking just vehicons. Skywarp's down, Barricade and Frenzy are out of commission, and Shadow Striker's down a leg, he visibly cringed as he realized how bad his other brother was as well. And it seems like you're not that much better. I'm fine. Starscream swiped his hand dismissively at Thundercracker. Have Flatline take the others back if he wants to, but... Thundercracker raised his sword, pointing it at his brother. No, you're not fine. You're going to get back to base while Sky Bite, Blastwave, Swift and I finish the job. If we can't beat the Autobots here, then the least we can do is leave with as much Energon as we can carry. He directed his sword toward Jetfire next. And besides, we're still getting enough from our own supply at the moment. We'll find another, but what's most important is that we have enough troops to last us. As much as Starscream didn't want to admit it, his brother was right. If they lost any more Viacons, then Megatron would have no choice but to send his away team with more. And that would mean, putting up with the one Decepticon he didn't want to deal with. Ah, fine. B but I expect results. Slowly flying away, Starscream gave Jetfire one last glare over his shoulder. We will M meet again, Jetfire. Soon. I don't doubt it. Jetfire retorted, just as the ground bridge to the dark side appeared in front of his old friend. Starscream turned around and slowly puttered through, but not without radioing in one final command as softly as possible, Nitra, send in the leapers. With that, the portal closed, leaving Jetfire and Izuku to confront the two Decepticons. Now, you'll have ME to contend with, Jetfire. Thundercracker stated confidently, the Cybercolliber glowing more intensely. And myself, of course. Skybite added, holding his head high. What do you say to that? Following a moment's pause, Jetfire came up with an answer. I say, W-H-R-R-T-S-C-H-Z-Z-T-S-C-H-Z-Z-T-S-C-H-Z-Z-C-H-K-T-Z asterisk without warning, the second-in-command transformed back into his jet mode, hovering in front of them before teasing, you'll have to catch us first. Come on, Zuku, let's have some fun. Back in the cockpit, Izuku felt himself get strapped in again, much to his chagrin. Oh no, not Aga, I-I-I-I-N. Blasting off through the air, Jetfire took off, leaving Skybite and Thundercracker in his contrails. W wa, hey, Thundercracker and the three mini cons all transformed as well, with Skybite not far behind. Get back here and fight. But Jetfire just laughed right back at them. Sorry, I feel like doing a bit of sightseeing first. Ha ha ha. Comma dot dot. Back down below, despite watching everything happen, Optimus Prime still could not believe his optics. After over a million years, there he was, his old friend, Jetfire. Alive and well with nary a scratch on him. How this was possible, he didn't know, and neither did any other Autobot. But if there was one thing that he was certain of, it's that the fight was far from over. And that was a sentiment that seemed to be agreed upon by every single one of his comrades, as they all called one another over the comms to make sure that what they were seeing wasn't any trick of the mind. Are you guys seeing this? Bulkhead exclaimed. I'm seeing it, but I can't believe it. Sideswipe answered. It's him. It's actually him. Sunstreaker belted out a laugh, which was shared by several others. Ha ha ha. And knew he couldn't be dead. No con, not even Sky Bite, could have done him in that easily. Springer, for his part, seemed fairly impressed. Huh, so this is the Jetfire, huh? Gotta admit, he knows a thing or two about making dramatic entrances. Oh, he can do way more than that, Springer. Jazz assured, while Bumblebee buzzed in agreement next to him, the duo gazing up to their leader. So, Prime, what's the word? Optimus grinned beneath his faceplate and clenched his fists, calling out to his comrades. Autobots, Joes, heroes. Jetfire's timely arrival has signaled the climax of this battle. Now, we must bring it to its conclusion. Let us end this.
Kyoka grinned widely at the command, more than happy to follow through. Couldn't have said it better myself, Prime. Yes, you took the words right out of my mouth. Hawk agreed as well, turning back to his troops. Joes, you heard the bot. Let's give it one final push. All at once, the team raised their fists into the air and exclaimed, Yo Joe. Before fanning out in all directions, readying their weapons for the final assault. Before Jazz could go anywhere, however, Optimus stopped him. Jazz, hold on. You and Bumblebee are with me. Skybite mentioned that there is a small group of Viacons making their way to the Energon while this battle is going on. We must stop them. It was then that Shoto spoke up. What about us, Prime? He gestured over to Kyoka, Mirko and Marissa. Should we come with? Of course. Optimus affirmed, though he raised a hand. But take caution, Energon Crystal can be quite volatile if anything were to happen to it. I suggest you all be mindful of your quirks around it, understood. Mirko gave a laugh at that. Ha. Huh. Well, that's easier said than done with me, but I'll try my best. She jerked her thumb up toward Jetfire and Izuku. But what about Deku? Will he be okay up there with your Macross looking friend? Do not worry. Jetfire is more than a capable warrior and protector. Prime assured as he transformed, with Jazz and Bumblebee following suit. He'll make sure that Izuku is safe. Now, let's roll out. With Shoto going with the Prime and Kyoka riding with Jazz as per usual, Mirko and Marissa quickly climbed into Bumblebee and the group raced off toward the Energon, intent on holding the line against the Decepticon threat. Comma dot dot. Back on the opposite side of the battlefield, though, another certain battle was going on, one that almost everyone was far too caught up in to notice what was happening. Strongarm and Swift were still going head to head, their super modes powering them well past their limits as they did battle. However, they each utilized different tactics, which made the battle a bit difficult. Swift mainly went for melee strikes with only the occasional ranged attack, while Strongarm was only able to use ranged attacks thanks to the nature of her minicon weapons. As a result, whenever Swift tried to get in close, Strongarm had to get away as quick as she could, frustrating them both more and more. Gah, would you hold still so I can brutalize you? Swift shouted as her shoulder cannons took aim and fired at the cadet. Strongarm rolled out of the way and came up in a crouch, her shoulder-mounted missile launcher at the ready. And would you hold still so I can blast you? All at once, several missiles went blasting out toward Swift, all of them homing in on her and exploding upon impact, resulting in a big, blue cloud of smoke. But, much to Strongarm's dismay, the Decepticon lieutenant leapt out of the smoke and lunged toward her, drill and saw spinning rapidly with powerful green energy. Cadet! Checkpoint exclaimed. Raise me and fire! W what? I! Do it! A H! Okay! Doing as she was instructed, Strongarm pulled Checkpoint's trigger, but instead of blasting Swift at point-blank range, he instead fired something else. An energy bubble had propelled out of his barrel and suddenly expanded over Strongarm, enveloping her in a protective barrier, which also stopped Swift in her tracks immediately. Thunk! MPH! HMPH! Swift muffled, slamming her fists on the glass. No fair! Coward! She reeled her arms back and brought them both down onto the barrier, intent on getting to her prey. This can't stay up forever. On her other arm, Scythe spoke up to Strongarm. She's right. We've got about 30 seconds before she brings it down. Any plans, cadet? Strongarm let out a breath and shook her head. Ha, huh, can't say I do. We really did go into this headlong without a strategy, didn't we? EH, I'd say it was worth it. Auntie Blaze assured. Better than our friends being reduced to scrap, right? Our friends, our friends. Strongarm beamed as inspiration struck her. Auntie Blaze, you're a genius. I I am. Oh. Er, I mean, yeah. I am, can you tell me why, though? Strongarm rolled her optics in amusement. Just watch. She craned her head back around toward her fellow Autobot Femmes, all of them clustered together a fair distance away from the fight. Hey, if any of you ladies wanna get in on this, feel free. The four were taken aback by her words, with Flair up hesitantly asking, Hey are you sure, Strongarm? Yes. Flair, why even ask that? Well, it's just, even with all of us put together, we weren't able to do much against her. RC explained. You're the first one to even get a significant hit in, honestly. Strongarm sent her teammates a reassuring smile. 
Gals, listen, you might not have super modes like this, but you can still fight. It was then that she noticed that the force field was beginning to flicker more, and by that point, Swift had managed to break her saw and drill through with a maniacal laugh. And I'd appreciate it if you'd help Emmy fight. Raising her left arm, Strongarm unleashed another barrage of energy blasts at Swift, Scythe's Gatling guns managing to strike her in the shoulders multiple times. But, even then, that only made Swift all the angrier. Pathetic. You believe you can hurt M.E. The great and powerful Swift. Back over with the other femmes, they were all visibly put off by the Decepticon's new, even more malicious nature. What is happening to her? Arizer muttered, grimacing at the display. It's like, she's become increasingly unhinged with every second. The Destruction Minicon team must be influencing her personality circuits. Windblade deduced, before taking out her Stormfall sword once again. That combined with her energy overload makes her all the more dangerous. Strongarm is right, we can't just stay here and twiddle our thumbs while she fights this battle for us. RC concurred, holstering one of her blades in favor of her pistol. Yeah, you're right, Windblade. Come on, ladies. We've gotta calm this glitch down. With a deep intake, Flare Up mustered up her courage and put her smile back on, her energy core starting to light up again. Alright, it's settled, then, and you know, I think I have an idea on how we can take, her down a few notches. She set her optics up to Arizer. Love, I'm gonna need your help to pull it off. How good are ya at flying in robot mode? Not as natural as I am in beast mode, but I am faster. Arizer replied and it is my preferred method of attacking with my rocket barrage. That's exactly what I'm counting on. We'll need that speed. Reaching down to her hip, Flare Up pulled out a circular pulse bomb with a glowing core. We're only gonna get one shot with this, so we'd better make it count. See, Windy, can you help Strongarm keep Swift preoccupied? The two nodded to her. Hmm, of course. Windblade responded confidently. RC, let's go. With that, the city speaker rocketed herself into battle, brandishing her sword while letting out a battle cry. Right behind you. Asterisk WHRRTSCHZZTSCHZZTSCHZZZCHKT asterisk taking to her vehicle mode, RC zoomed ahead, matching Windblade's speed as they closed in on the battle. Flare Up nudged her chin to her maximal companion. And, as for us, we're gonna sneak around the back as quick and, delicately as we can. Arizer, without missing a beat, smirked down to flare up with a raised irage. So basically, the exact opposite of what you usually are. Got it. The Autobot scout winced, but smiled through it all the same, narrowing her optics at Arizer playfully. Oh ho, alright, ya cheeky bird lady. I'm gonna get ya back for that one at some point. Now come on, she waved the pulse bomb in her hand for emphasis, let's give Swift a bang in good time. But, just as the two were about to rush off. Um, excuse me. The two femmes' optics widened and they whirled their heads down toward Jinx, Momo and Quick Kick, both still standing down near their feet. The Kunoichi had her hands on her hips, sending a questioning gaze up to the dup. But is there anything we can do in this little plan of yours? Oh, bugger, right. Flare Up suddenly felt very awkward, having forgotten about the two ladies. She placed a hand to her neck sheepishly, giving an uncertain reply, Er, well, um, T to tell ya the truth, girls, I'm not sure. I mean, her sights shifted over to Swift as Strongarm, Windblade and RC all clashed with her. It's not exactly all that safe to get close to Swift at the moment, especially with all that energy and how unhinged she is. Quick Kick crossed her arms over her chest defiantly. Ah, uh, are you forgetting that we just took down Shadow Striker over there, huh? The four of them were all taken aback when they saw that the Decepticon sniper was nowhere in sight, much to Quick Kick's chagrin. W wa, where'd she go? With an irritated grumble, Momo shook her head. Darn, she must have slinked off when we weren't paying attention. But that doesn't matter now. Her focus shifted back to the femmes. What does matter is that we can help. We just need to get close to Swift without her noticing, and since you two are already trying to do that anyway. Ah, I see what you're getting at. Flare Up shared a knowing smile with Arizer before both knelt down. Flare picked Jinx and Momo up while Arizer went for quick kick. We'll get ya where ya need to be, loves. You ready? As ready as we'll ever be. Kenzie affirmed, climbing onto Arizer's shoulder and raising a fist.
Let's go kick that deceptive bitch's ass. Arizer simply chuckled as she took to the sky, with the other three not far behind skirting along the perimeter of the battle. Meanwhile, RC, Windblade and Strongarm had re-engaged with Swift, the former two clashing their energy swords with the Decepticon on either side while Strongarm transformed into vehicle mode, the Minicons remaining attached with Checkpoint and Scythe on either side while Anti-Blaze was on her roof. All at once, Strongarm unloaded everything she had on her target, be it bullets, energy beams or missiles, calling out to her teammates, move. Now. The pink and red Autobots did so at staggering speed, which caused Swift to stumble forward as she pushed against nothing but air. Gah. Hey. What's the big? Hey. Bulky. Dueler hollered in her ear. Keep focused. Swift's optics darted up. H huh. Oh boy. Kra Chum the excessive blast made its impact, resulting in yet another cloud of billowing smoke where the Decepticon was. RC and Windblade regrouped with Strongarm, the latter keeping her weapons trained on the same spot, but then it happened. Asterisk WHRRTSCHZZTSCHZZTSCHZZZCHKT asterisk jumping up and transforming, Swift flew straight out of the smoke, her copter blades dispersing the cloud with ease. On either wing of her Apache mode, Drillbit and Landslide had secured themselves, all while Dueler had moved to the underside of her cockpit, his cannons aimed directly down at them. Ha 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 ha. Once again, you underestimate my brilliant resilience to your meager efforts. I am Swift, proud Decepticon Lieutenant. The cannons began charging up, and I will not be beaten by the likes of Q Q Q Q Boom. Ah. All of a sudden, from off in the trees, a barrage of laser fire came shooting up at Swift, aimed directly at her rear stabilizer fan. With just a few shots, the stabilizer was left severely damaged and on fire, a trail of smoke being left behind as Swift was forced back down to Earth. Mayday. Mayday. Landslide cried out. We're going down, boys. Drill bit announced. Brace yourselves. Ha, huh, I knew this was a mistake. Dueler deadpanned before they all finally hit the ground, with Swift being forced to transform upon impact. Even then, however, all of the destruction mini-cons remained attached to her, and despite the newfound pain in her ankles, Swift powered through and stood up. With her metal teeth and fists all clenched in rage, she screamed as loud as her vocal processor would allow. Gra. WHO did that. WHO dares to clip the great Swift's wings. In the blink of an optic, Swift was met with flare up directly behind her, with Jinx, Momo, and her pulse bomb in hand. Ah, uh, that'd be me. Quick as a beat, Flare shoved the bomb onto the small of Swift's back, making her gasp before she turned around to swipe at her. However, thanks to a well-placed long staff of Momo's creation, she instead ended up tripping over herself, her damaged ankles blowing out afterward. Ooh, bad move there, hun. Jinx teased, knowing her quirk had something to do with that last part. Momo ditched the staff and gave Swift a condescending wink. Better luck next time. Next time, is now. The jets on Swift's back thrusted her up into the air above Flare Up and Jinx, the duo taking a step back as she reeled her arms back and readied her weapons. I don't know where you get off thinking you can beat me, but rest assured, I will break you for, ah. Swift didn't get to finish her threat as, from behind, Arizer came zooming in shoulder tackled Swift back down, followed by quick kick jumping from the bird bot's shoulder and slamming her foot right into the con's cheek. Break this, ya loud mouth. Landing on the ground and breaking into a sprint, Kenzie, called back up to the maximal, Arizer. You're good to go. Of course. Arizer saluted, giving a brief glance down to Strongarm. Let's finish this together, shall we? Transforming back into robot mode, Strongarm wore an eager smile and gave her a thumbs up. Took the words right out of my mouth. Focusing her targeting system on the pulse bomb, Strongarm raised her weapons one more time. Ready, aim, once her target was locked on, she cried out, fire. And unleashed her final blast upon Swift, followed by Arizer soon after. Justice reigns from above, the Maximal's voice echoed out as her signature rocket barrage unloaded onto Swift, who didn't see the attack coming until it was too late. And once she did, she could only say one thing, holy slaaa. Ka thoooooom. The attack made contact and Swift was practically blown apart into several pieces, her limbs flying all over the place. Somehow, 
Though, the pulse bomb only blew through her midsection, as her upper chest was left completely intact. The destruction Minicon team were forced to unlink from her as they were scattered about, transforming back into their robot modes from the sheer shock. B by Primus. Drill Bit cried out, seeing the pieces of his partner scattered about everywhere. You, you killed her. Thunk the very next second, however, he was proven wrong when, of all things, Swift's upper torso landed next to him, with her head still attached and very much alive. It was obvious that she was in a state of shock, though, trembling as her eyes changed back from green to red. I I I A M T H the G G G great and P P powerful Swift. I I can't be be defeated. The Autobot Femmes, Momo, Jinx and Quick Kick all gathered together, peering down at Swift with nothing but contempt. Well, guess what? Strongarm leaned down, making Drill Bit and Landslide cower back as she glared into Swift's optics. You just were. Landslide raised his saw arm, shouting, S stay back. I'm warning ya. Ahem. Off to the side, Dueler piped up, the destruction team leader skulking over while glowering at the larger bots. Alright, you bulks, I've seen more than enough. He stomped his way between Strongarm and Swift, narrowing his eyes at the Minicon Council as they too detached from Strongarm. Scythe. He loathingly regarded the sergeant. Dueler. Scythe spat back, his team preparing for a small showdown. We gonna have any more problems here. Not if you let us leave in peace, old timer. Turning around, Dueler zeroed in on Swift, whose head was still twitching as her expression became etched with fear. And as for you, the femme flinched, unable to defend herself, but the strike she was expecting only came in the form of a tiny punch to the helm, followed by Dueler pointing at her. Next time we do this, do not blow up or lose your cool, ya hear me? Swift blinked in confusion, her head twitching to the side. NN next time. The minicon let out a reluctant sigh, placing his fists to his hips. Yeah, you, you did an alright job. My destruction love and spark liked what I saw, even if ya did lose your mind. He poked the center of her face to drive his point home. But mindless carnage ain't all that destruction is, ya know. There's a finesse to it that y'all gotta learn. And I'm gonna make sure y'all learn it. Understood, rookie. With a hopeful, if crooked, smile, Swift raised her stubby arm in a form of salute. S sir, yes, sir. I w w won't disappoint you. I hope not. Now, let's get y'all outta here so y'all won't die on us. Dueler craned his head back toward the woods and called out, Yo. Sniper. Poking her head out of the underbrush, Shadow Striker replied, We. What is Z, Sacra Blue? Hobbling out of the bushes on one leg, her optics widened at the state of her teammate, who waved up at her with her stub. Hee hee, Hayashish Shadow. Ha, huh, why am I not surprised? Placing a hand to her helm, Shadow Striker radioed back to their HQ. Shadow Striker to Darkseid, we require a ground bridge. We have multiple injured. As the destruction mini-cons gathered Swift's limbs and pelvis, their portal out opened up, leaving Shadow Striker to glare at the Autobots. Enjoy your victory while you can, Autobots. Next time, you will not be so lucky. RC narrowed her optics in confusion. What? What do you mean? This battle isn't over ye. Oh, believe me, it is. Shadow Striker pointed to the sky. Simply look up and you will see. Picking Swift's torso up, she hobbled her way through the portal, sneering to the Autobots all the while. However, she seemed particularly focused on Flare Up before simply saying, Adieu, Cherie. With that, the portal closed, leaving Flare Up to let out a short huff. Jinx raised a curious brow up to the orange and red femme. I'm guessing you know her well. Flare Up winced and shook her head. It's, complicated. She sent a sympathetic glance toward RC. A and for some, it's uncomfortable, so... Let's not get into that here, please. RC requested, raising a hand to stop Flair from going further. We've already had enough crazy things happen. Right now, I just want to know what Shadow meant by, we've already won. Um, I believe that is what she was referring to. Arizer said while pointing skyward, causing the other femmes to crane their heads up. And that's when they all saw him. The white and red bot with the thruster pack and the bright blue visor, holding Izuku in one hand while aiming his blaster at incoming Viacons with the other. All at once, RC, Flare Up, Strongarm and especially Windblade were all left stunned and silenced, 
watching as the Autobot kept downing Khan's left and right without much effort. RC covered her mouth in shock while Strongarm and Flare Up broke out into shaky yet excited smiles, letting out joyous laughs all the while. Windblade, meanwhile, almost fell to her knees, she was so shocked. She had been there on that day. She had watched it happen. The supernova had destroyed almost everything in its vicinity. And yet somehow, some way, there he was. Alive and well. Ha, huh, no way. Taking a few steps forward, she approached the cliffside, ready to take flight as well. He's back, ha ha ha, he's back. W who's back? Momo called out to her partner, running up next to her. Windblade, who's that Autobot? And why does he have Midoriya with him? Oh, Momo, I'm not sure about that last part, but that bot, Windblade shook her finger toward him. That is the bot who Skybite boasted about killing in that supernova. But you know what? I should have known that wouldn't keep him down. She transformed into her jet mode and opened her cockpit, beckoning Momo to join her. Come on, let's go get Izuku. Then, I can introduce you to Jetfire. Despite her lingering confusion, Momo did as the city speaker said, climbing up and strapping herself in before they both took off into the sky. However, once they were gone, it was only then that Mackenzie noticed, someone else was missing. Hey, did anyone see where Edgeshot went? No, but knowing him, I wouldn't be surprised if he'd noticed something the rest of us didn't. Jinx concluded, being all too familiar with her old friend's tactics. Now come, we should hurry and help the others where we can. Comma dot dot. Back with Optimus and his team, they had just emerged through a hidden tunnel that led to the other side of the ridge they were on. Which, subsequently, was where the Energon was. As they rolled on, however, Kyoko wasn't all too sure how a group of Viacons had been able to sneak through such an obvious tunnel. How the heck did we miss these cons getting past us? She wondered out loud. I mean, I know the battle out there's pretty chaotic, but still. Perhaps they had managed to find another way around, but we can speculate later. Optimus replied through Jazz's come link. Right now, what is important is that we, oh, all of a sudden, Prime pulled to a halt in front of the others, prompting them to do the same. Autobots, transform, he said calmly, letting Shoto out of his cab. Jazz and Bumblebee allowed their passengers to disembark as well before they transformed, allowing them all to look out over the massive mountainside full of Energon. It was quite the sight to behold, especially for Shoto and Mirko. Whoa, so that's Energon, huh? The rabbit hero set her sights up to Bumblebee. The stuff that you run on. B gave a thumbs up. ZRKT, er darn tootin. ZRKT, nectar of the gods, ZRKT, is clear as crystal. Guess the avalanche is what exposed all of it in the first place. Shoto noted, pointing down to the collection of boulders and rubble down in the ravine that separated them from the Energon. But, where are the Viacons? Prime raised a hand, pointing toward an area just adjacent from them. See for yourself, everyone followed his finger and, much to their astonishment, were met with an even more shocking sight. There, laying in a pile of broken pieces, were the Viacons, all of them sparking and groaning in pain. They were all still online, but many of their limbs had been cleanly sliced off, meaning they couldn't do anything to resist if they'd tried. And, meditating on top of this pile, was none other than Edgeshot. He opened his eyes and bowed his head toward the new arrivals. Optimus, everyone, welcome. I was expecting someone to find this place sooner or later. E edge shot. Kyoka exclaimed. H how did you, when did you, I thought you were with Momo. I was. The ninja hero stood and leapt off the Viacon heap, landing in front of them all. But she is in good hands and I sensed trouble nearby, so I told her to remain with Strongarm and the others while I took care of it. He craned his head back toward the pile of living parts. And I'm glad that I did, otherwise, these cons would have taken the Energon already. While almost everyone was surprised by the ninja's efficiency, a certain bunny-eared woman was livid. Bra, Damn it, ninja boy. She skulked up to Edgeshot, thrusting a finger in his face. Is it just your personal job to stop me from having a good time? I was all set to batter some Viacan's heads in and you just hogged all the glory for yourself. Edgeshot closed his eyes, giving her a small bow. My apologies. I was unaware that you were willing to throw yourself into danger recklessly once again. The hell did you say? Before a fight could break out, 
Kyoko ran over and stood between them, pushing the two away from each other. Whoa, whoa, would you two just stop with the bickering? We're here to fight Decepticons, not each other. Mirko snapped her head down to Kyoko with a manic glare. Yeah, exactly. But he keeps denying me that satisfaction. She thrust a finger to him while waving her arm up and down, fuming from her ears. He's such a freaking tease. I'm simply searching for the most efficient way to defeat our enemies, Mirko. Edge shot opened his eyes again. Nothing more. The rabbit hero huffed and crossed her arms over her chest. HMPH. Well that may be nice for you, but I like doing things the hard way. As they continued bickering back and forth, Kyoka and Shoto shared a glance, both thinking the same thing. They're arguing like an old married couple. Shoto stated bluntly. Yup, and something tells me it ain't gonna stop. Kyoka affirmed. Optimus took that moment to interject. Ahem, well, in any case, I must thank you, Edgeshot. Because of your efforts, our securing of the Energon will be, but then, Optimus trailed off when he noticed something out the corner of his optic, leading him to set his sights high up toward the top of the ridge on their side of the ravine. There, he saw three large, dark blue, flat-nosed tanker trucks come pulling up to the edge of the craggy cliff, and all of them had the Decepticon insignia on it. Oh no! The group directed their attention upward as well, and upon seeing this, Mirko's smile returned tenfold. Oh ho ho ho! Yes! Come on, baby! Give me a real fight! Edge shot facepalmed immediately after. Asterisk W H R R T S C H Z Z T S C H Z Z T S C H Z Z C H K T Asterisk to everyone else's chagrin, the Viacons all answered her request. The cab of the trucks became their bulky, armored torsos, with the oil tankers on the trailers becoming big arms that seemed to be modified into massive spear-like bludgeon weapons. The cons, legs were comparatively small, forming from the remainder of the trailer hitches. And, instead of the normal Viacon head, these cons had heavy armor helmets that kept their heads close to their bodies, making them seem squat while still being huge. But the most notable feature, aside from their arms, were the three big thrusters on their backs, which all powered up the moment they entered robot mode and then suddenly propelled them into the air, where they proceeded to come crashing down toward the group. ZRKT, incoming. Bumblebee blasted through his speakers, prompting everyone to dodge as the three cons landed. However, that didn't help them. Because the moment they touched down, a huge energy burst exploded from the impact zone, causing the group to get thrown all over the place as dust and dirt flew into the air. The bulky Viacons wasted no time in emerging from the veil of sand, their V-shaped visors glaring at the team with malevolent intent. Hawk Hawk. Okay, what are those? Marissa exclaimed. Ow. Leapers. Jazz bemoaned, shaking the dirt off of him. Seriously. These things are the worst. He brought out his subsonic repeater while Bumblebee readied his plasma cannon, aiming both at the three bruisers. But where'd they come from? We haven't seen Screamer use any of these. Just then, however, a loud, bellowing cackle was heard from above, prompting the bots and humans to look up once again. Standing there with his arms crossed and his head thrown back in laughter, was Blastwave, who leapt down and crashed directly next to the group. Ha ha ha. Foolish Autobots, did you not think that we would be keeping secrets in back pocket? Optimus Optics widened. You've been staying your hand. Hiding your resources until the time was right. Blastwave's smirk widened. Now you are catching on. He he he, yes, like all good generals, Unacronus knows when and when not to bring out big guns. He extended his hand out toward the leapers. As you can see, now is time to bring out big guns. And how'd you get here? Edgeshot asked pointedly. Last I saw, you were in a scuffle with Bulkhead and Roadblock. A sad sigh escaped Blastwave's throat, lowering his head solemnly. Yes, well, when Blastwave received emergency call from Viacon you slaughtered, he disengaged battle and the doctor covered his escape. He clenched his fist in ire. And trust me, when Blastwave is through with you, you will pay dearly for costing him his battle. Now, Flatline works to bring injured Skywarp back to base, and Thundercracker goes to aid tiny baby Starscream and Skybite against the traitor. That left Kyoka and the other heroes confused. W what? Traitor? What's he talking about? We can talk about that later, Kyoka. Optimus dismissed politely, his attention going back to the Leapers, who were all beginning to skulk around them. 
Right now, we need to deal with these. Aim for the thruster packs on their backs. It serves as their propulsion, but is also a weak point. Shoto raised a brow up to Optimus. And what about Blastwave? Optimus brought out his Energon Axe, Optics zeroing in on the munitions expert. I will handle him, and a leaper if I must. What? Jazz shouted, while Bumblebee buzzed in alarm. Prime, don't. A leaper and Blastwave is just asking, for trouble. We need backup, we need. Honk honk. The sudden loud horn prompted everyone's eyes to go back to the tunnel, where they saw a pair of headlines blaring through the darkness. Barreling through the exit just a few seconds later came a certain green Hummer pickup truck, with a heavy machine gun and its wielder riding on top of its roof. W O O O O Who? Roadblock cried out as he took aim and fired as he and Bulkhead drove by, shooting right at Blastwave and making the Decepticon recoil. Ow! You again! Blastwave growled, though he also grinned in anticipation. And Bulkhead. Our fight's not over, Blastwave. Bulkhead stated, allowing Roadblock to jump off his back with Modus before transforming. Bringing out his wrecking mace, the rotund Autobot nudged his head over to his leader. Prime. Roadblock and I got Blastwave. You just make sure those leapers don't accidentally destroy us. Optimus grinned beneath his faceplate and nodded. Great timing, Bulkhead. And thank you. He set his sights down to the others, just as the leapers completely surrounded them. Everyone, take a partner and a leaper. Edge shot, escort Agent Fairborn away from here. Understood. The ninja hero obliged, stepping closer to the medic. Come, follow me. Marissa more than gladly followed, though they were almost immediately set upon by a leaper and one of its bludgeon arms. But then, Mirko came leaping in with a flying kick, knocking its arm back. Oh, no ya don't. Bumblebee quickly joined her, the duo tackling the larger con and making it stumble backward, all while Mirko winked and gave a thumbs up to Edgeshot. Ya owe me for that, just so ya know, fold a boy. Edgeshot deadpanned at her, but shook his head. Just take it, and get out of here. Once both of them were out of the line of fire, the Autobots, Mirko, Kyoka and Shoto went to work on the Leapers, who lived up to their designation by all suddenly leaping into the fray and out of range of most attacks. But even then, that only lasted a couple seconds before they came crashing down once again, slamming their spear bludgeons into the rocky terrain to unleash more waves of powerful energy at them. However, Shoto wasn't about to fall for the same trick twice. Stamping his foot to the ground, he unleashed a gargantuan wave of ice across the field, creating walls to absorb and protect the group from the pulse attacks. Everyone, use these as cover. He advised. Woo. Not bad. Jazz retracted his left hand and brought out his grappling hook, swinging his way up to one of the highest ice spires to perch atop it. Makes for a great vantage point, too. Aiming his subsonic repeater at one of the leapers, he unleashed a continuous, rapid-fire assault upon its back, seeing results immediately as the thrusters began sparking a little. Prime, meanwhile, took a more direct approach. One of the leapers had its arm stuck in the ground, taking longer to pull it out. Thus, he brought his Energon Axe in for a powerful swing to its back, doing significant damage to a thruster before the Leaper was able to collect itself. With a guttural growl, the Khan swung its arm around, but Prime opened his arms and caught the strike, letting out a grunt as he stood his ground. Earphone Jack. He called out. Perhaps some noise would be beneficial. You know I'm all about it. Kyoka acknowledged, plugging her jacks into her boots as she fell to her back, keeping her legs and shins aimed at the Viacan's head. Let's see how y'all like this beat, Khan. Releasing the onslaught of sonic waves, the attack proved fruitful with the leaper roaring and bringing an arm up to its audio receptors, forced to stumble backward. It was then that Kyoka saw that Bumblebee wasn't too far away, and he was charging his plasma blaster up fairly well. B. Let it loose. Once the energy had reached a level that be deemed suitable, the yellow Autobot brought up his battle mask, saying, ZRKT, hasta la vista, baby. All at once, he shot the collected energy at the Khan's back, which was just enough to overload and make it explode, the leaper blowing to pieces all over the place. Excellent work, Bumblebee. Optimus commended, only to see another leaper go soaring over the ice wall that Shoto made. At the same time, though, Jazz aimed his grappling hook at it and caught it by the leg, taking him along with it. Woo baby, we're flying now. 
Following after them, Shoto was surfing across an ice bridge of his own creation, all while fire danced on his left arm. I'm gonna help Jazz. You guys, find Mirko. I lost track of her and the other leaper. Realizing this, Prime craned his head down toward his scout. Bumblebee, did you see where they went? I thought you were helping Mirko. ZRKT, ah, about that, Bumblebee motioned for the team to follow him, jogging through the icy field until they came upon a secluded corner. ZRKT, see for yourself. Hiya. To everyone's astonishment, Mirko was taking on a leaper all by herself, kicking its heavy armored hide with tenacious fury. Her rapid kicks were also, surprisingly enough, actually putting a few dents into it. How this was possible, neither B, Prime nor Kyoka could comprehend, but if they were to assume, it was likely pure adrenaline on her part. They could see the rabbit hero's muscles tighten, sweat dripping from her forehead as her relentless strikes only increased in strength. Ha! Huh. Come on, ya bucket of bolts. Is that all ya got? Bra! The leaper held its dented chest, dumbfounded by what was happening. Its kind were built to withstand heavy artillery fire and yet somehow, this organic was denting it. This cannot be. Its thrusters powering up again, the leaper flew straight up and out of the way of another incoming kick, leaving Mirko to tuck and roll into a crouched landing. Her sights snapped up to the con and screamed, Hey! I'm not finished with, ooh, seeing the leaper falling back down to her, the rabbit girl's wild smirk reappeared instantly. Oh, so that's how y'all wanna play. Fine, then. Her leg muscles tightened up before she sprung straight up into the air, whipping herself around for another flying kick. Yeah. The two opponents collided in midair, but this time, Mirko was the one who was knocked down, her body leaving and imprinting in the rock below. She is insane, Kyoka concluded. She is certifiably insane. ZKRT, can't argue with that. B agreed. Optimus took out his ion blaster, proceeding forward with utmost urgency. I will help Mirko. The two of you, go see if Jazz and Shoto need assistance. The duo nodded up to their leader and they ran off in the opposite direction. He proceeded forward slowly and as silently as he could, the leaper landing with its back turned toward him as it glared down at Mirko. Ha ha ha, not so tough now, are ya, human? Pointing one of its spear bludgeons down, the arm weapon began to transform into a large, arm-mounted cannon, which charged up with energy. Time to put you in your place. Mirko narrowed her eyes at the con and was about to welcome the threat, but then she saw Optimus slowly approaching from behind, which brought her smirk back tenfold. Oh ho, so now you bring out the big guns. She teased. Here I thought you leapers were one-trick ponies. Grr, we were told not to open fire around the Energon unless absolutely necessary. The leaper explained, pushing his arm closer to Mirko until the weapon was at point-blank range. I'd say this counts. Oh, so you're gonna take the easy way out, the rabbit hero deduced. Put your opponent into a compromising position and then blast me to bits without any sort of fighting chance. She raised her chin up to him challengingly. Sounds to me like you're taking the coward's way out. I am not a coward. The leaper insisted. And I'm gonna prove. Pow 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 pow. Triple A AUG. Unfortunately, the leaper wouldn't get to prove anything as a sharp pain overcame him from his back, which began sparking and overloading. Warning lights and messages overcame his optic sensors as he spun around, only to see Optimus standing there with his Energon axe at the ready. The Autobot leader swung it into the dents that Mirko had made in its chest, successfully cleaving through before bringing his Ion Blaster back up. Take that, Decepticon Punk. Pow that was the last straw. The Leaper blew up and its parts were sent scattering all throughout the area, though Optimus was able to shield Mirko with his body before it happened. Once things had settled, Optimus pulled himself back and peered down to Mirko, who winked and gave him a thumbs up. The Prime, however, was not as impressed. That was incredibly dangerous, Mirko. I hope you know that. Oh, trust me, I know. Mirko assured, her wild grin plastered across her features. And it's the kind of stuff I live for. Optimus sighed and stood up, putting his weapons away. Well, I suppose that is one less leaper we have to worry about. Still. I am quite surprised. Very few Autobots have been able to even so much as a dent a leaper, and yet you left enough for its armor to be penetrated. Ah, hey, yeah, about that, Mirko's smile became a bit sheepish as she glanced down to her lower half. 
Let's just say I'm not laying down here by choice. Elaborate, please. A boisterous laugh escaped the woman's throat, proclaiming, ha ha ha. My legs are shattered from the knees down. Ha ha ha. Optimus face pumped. He knew she couldn't have done all of that without going unscathed. Ha, Agent Fairborn, are you nearby? Comma dot dot. Across the field of ice, meanwhile, Kyoka and Bumblebee had just found where the last leaper landed, with Jazz using the wheels on his heels to skate around and blast it from all sides. Shoto was doing much of the same, only blasting out fire in the Khan's optics to try and blind it. Ha, huh, would ya look at that. Kyoka eyed her yellow friend, who tilted his head down in kind. Those two have got it all handled. However, that wouldn't last, as the leaper flexed its arms and the large weapons transformed into shields, blocking the incoming fire. ZRKT, ah, uh, I think it's, ZRKT, catching on. B pointed out. Kyoka clicked her tongue in annoyance. TCH, of course. Always gotta be something, but, not two seconds later, an idea formed in her head, seeing that it wasn't a perfect barrier. There were two gaps, one on the Khan's front side and one to its back. Approaching it from the front wasn't the best option, but rather foolishly, the Khan couldn't block its backside given the range of its bulky arms. Hey, whoever designed these things is an idiot. ZRKT, that'd be, ZRKT, Shockwave. B answered. Okay, then, Shockwave's an idiot. ZRKT, if he hears that, ZRKT, you're dead. Rolling her eyes, Kyoka pointed to the leaper, which continued to move in a circle while blocking Shoto and Jazz, attacks. Whatever. Look, obviously he made them combat first, defense and intelligence last. If we can speed into those barriers, we can take him off his feet so that Jazz and Todoroki can land the finishing blow. Bumblebee buzzed in agreement and transformed, opening his passenger side door for her. ZRKT, alright. ZRTK, let's do it, to it. Climbing into the VW Beetle, Kyoka raised her hand, keeping her focus on the leaper. Wait, once its back was turned to them again, she gave the signal, now. Go. All at once, B stepped on the gas and bolted for the leaper, who immediately took notice of the loud engine noise. It went to activate its thrusters, but Bumblebee proved to be faster, smashing directly into its legs and taking it off balance. And the thrusters still went off anyway, sending it careening into the nearest rock wall. Crash with its head and upper body stuck, Jazz and Shoto did a double take, but Kyoka stuck her head out the car window and called out, Guys. Finish it. On it, thanks. Shoto once more slammed his foot to the ground and sent a large spire of ice at the trapped opponent, stabbing through its back and pinning it in place. Jazz. No need to tell me twice. Concentrating their firepower, the duo poured everything into the Khan's thrusters, which quickly overloaded and blew it, and the rock wall to smithereens. Before anyone knew it, several massive rocks and boulders were bearing down the ridge toward them, the group staring in abject horror. Oh scrap. Jazz reached down, scooped Shoto up and transformed, hollering, time to go. Before he and B drove off as fast as they could, narrowly avoiding the avalanche. Thankfully, the rocks all went tumbling down into the ravine, much like the others that had fallen on it opposite side. Still, that didn't do much to relieve the four of their stress as they all gathered together, Kyoka in particular breathing erratically. Ha, ha ha, holy crap. Yeah, probably should have seen that coming. Shoto said as calmly as he could, letting out a deep sigh. Sorry about that. Jazz rubbed his head and dismissed the apology. Nah, it's fine. Honestly, probably should have seen that coming myself. He stood up and placed his hands on his hip. But what's important is everybody's alright and, we've got another leaper down. Yep, and Optimus is helping Mirko with the last one. Kyoka informed. Which means all that's left is, THOOM asterisk, uh oh. The perplet brought her sights up to the ice walls around them, seeing them shake and shatter with every quake beneath their feet. THOOM 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 to their right, one wall in particular began to crack egregiously, which was all the warning that Kyoka needed. Guys, we should run, right? Jazz, Shoto and Bumblebee were all quick to agree with her on that. ZRKT, run for your life. On that note, the yellow bug led the way picking Shoto up while Jazz went for Kyoka. However, they couldn't get away far enough before. 
C-R-A-A-A-S-S-S-S-H-H-H. The ice wall was blown to bits as Bulkhead's body was sent careening through, the large Autobot holding roadblock and injured roadblock in his hand. The duo went straight over the group's heads and Bulkhead clattered to the rocky ground in front of them, blocking their path as the perpetrator of their defeat stomped onto the scene behind them. There, towering over them all, was Blastwave, his expression twisted in seething rage and one arm transformed into his X-18 scrapmaker, shooting down all of the ice that was in his path. Bahahaha. The munitions expert bellowed, slowly lurking toward them with a vengeful grin and red optics glaring at them. Blastwave is coming to get you, babies. At this point, even Shoto was feeling somewhat uncertain. So, ever fought him before? We've confronted him before, but me personally. Kyoka shook her head. Nope, never. Jazz and B transformed their free arms into their blasters, preparing for anything. Well, we're gonna have to fight him if we wanna make it out of here. Get ready, guys, were. But just then, Bulkhead actually piped up behind them. No. Gah. The four whirled their heads back to see the wrecker slowly but surely standing to his feet, still holding onto roadblock all the while. This, this is our fight. Bulkhead stated determinedly. And we're gonna finish it. His focus shifted down to his GI. Joe friend, seeing that, even with his mouth and shoulder bleeding, the man still stood just as firm. You with me, Roadblock. Roadblock chortled and wiped the blood away from his mouth, spitting out the rest, before his eyes began to glow a bright, golden color. I'm with y'all all the way, Bulk. Now, it's time to stop holding back. Let me down, would ya? Without any argument, Bulk had obliged, and Roadblock discarded his gloves, boots, and the bandoliers on his person. Guys, remember when I said I didn't like talking about my quirk? Least not while I'm off the battlefield. Ah, uh, yeah. Kyoka muttered hesitantly. Well, you're about to see why. Just, make sure you're out of the way for this. Roadblock took in a deep breath, and let out a blood-curdling scream that took them all aback. Yeah. Doubling over as his body began to convulse, Roadblock's fists and teeth clenched in exertion. The others could only watch as, before their very eyes, Roadblock's body began morphing and changing. His skin hardened and cracked into a solid, gray material that, oddly enough, had the occasional yellow lines going down his arms, torso and what they could see of his legs. His entire body grew exponentially as well, to the point that he was probably as big as Bulkhead himself. His facial hair had disappeared, instead replaced by a pronounced lower jaw that had jagged, teeth, protruding from it, as well as a large brow that acted as an extra layer of armor above his eyes. Between all of that and his powerful arms and legs, Roadblock had truly become, a monster. Draw triple A ah. His thunderous roar shook the very environment around him, leaving everybody, Blastwave included, astonished. Surprisingly, his clothes had grown with him, which Kyoka could only deduce meant that they were made with his quirk in mind. Holy shit. Kyoka. The earphone jack user's head snapped around when she heard a familiar voice, and through the remains of the ice, Jinx and Quick Kick came sprinting toward them. The two stopped in front of her, Jinx relieved to see her student. Oh, thank goodness. I'm so glad that you're okay. When we saw the Decepticons jumping all over the place, we, oh dear. Glancing up to Roadblock, Kyoka gave a curt nod. Yeah, things have been kinda crazy here. That much is obvious. Quick Kick agreed, peering up to her fellow Joe. Uh, Roadblock, you with us. A growl escaped the monster's throat as he locked his eyes upon them, slowly giving a thumbs up. Hmm, yeah, girls. I'm here. He spoke, his voice now much deeper and gravelier than before. So, this is your quirk, huh, Rody? Bulkhead asked. It is. Jinx confirmed. Simply put, it's called, Road Monster. It allowed Roadblock to transform into the beast you see before you, and in addition, it allows him to manipulate any asphalt, tarmac or blacktop he comes across. I can even control tar itself a bit. Roadblock added, clenching an eager fist while smiling at Bulkhead. But, since there's nothing but normal rock around here, I think we're gonna have to do this the old-fashioned way, right Bulk? Bulkhead grinned eagerly and raised his fist in kind, bumping it against roadblocks. Haha, now you're talking. Let's take care of Blastwave and end this. He nudged his head down to the others. Guys, make some room. This is gonna get ugly. Da, for you. Blastwave barreled forward, 
yowling in blood-lusting fury as he fired off his heavy weapon at the duo. Gra Ayaya. While the others got clear of the incoming carnage, Roadblock took the initiative and shielded Bulkhead with his body, the bullets only bouncing off his rock-solid hide. Gur, this guy's starting to piss me off. Let's get this done so I can whip up some beef stroganov. No idea what that is, but I'm with ya. Bulkhead brought out his armed cannons and aimed past Roadblock, peeking over the road monster's shoulder to make sure he aimed right. But, even as his blasts made contact with Blastwave, the Decepticon simply powered through and kept going, only getting angrier with every shot he took. For the love of, he won't slow down. I can arrange that. Lurching forward, Roadblock let out a guttural roar and slammed both fists to the ground, making it shake as multiple large cracks formed beneath him. Blastwave was thrown off balance and then fell flat on his face, his Gatling gun shooting bullets high into the air all the while. Raw. Yo Joe. Roadblock rushed headlong toward Blastwave's shoulder first, tackling the Decepticon further back. Bulkhead. Double team. Transforming into his Hummer mode, Bulkhead drove in as fast as he could. I've got your back. He rammed himself straight into Blastwave's legs, taking the con off his feet again, but Roadblock was there in an instant to grab him by the throat. Just as quickly, Bulkhead transformed again and also grabbed Blastwave, with him and Roadblock following up by giving him a double choke slam straight into the stone. Greya, his features twisting into a contemptuous snarl, Blastwave's shoulder cannons rotated forward, charging up to fire at the two. I will not be beaten, crunch, huh. Unfortunately, before he could react, Roadblock had taken both of cannon barrels and crushed them in his hands, closing them off right as they were about to fire. Oh no. Blam. Ah. Soot and fire erupted from Blastwave's shoulders, the con fumbling beneath the Autobot and Joe trying to put it all out. Fire. Fee I am on fire. He eventually managed to get to his feet, but all he did was run around as the fire spread to the entire upper half of his body. Help. My mesh. It burns. He quickly called up the first Decepticon who came to mind, shouting, Doctor. Doctor. Bring Blastwave back. I am in flames. As if on cue, a ground bridge portal opened up before him, and he quickly dove in, allowing it to close only a moment after. Bulkhead and Roadblock both stared dumbfoundedly after their opponent, wondering just what they had witnessed. Well, that was interesting. Rubbing his head, Bulkhead could only offer a shrug. Yeah, Blastwave's always been like that, really. Ya yeah, get used to it. He gave Roadblock the once over and chuckled a bit. Haha. <laughs> If I'd known you'd been keeping this in your back pocket, though, I probably would have egged ya to do this earlier. Yeah, well, I can't really stay like this for long. On that note, Roadblock began shrinking back down until his was back to normal, letting out an exerting breath all the while. Ha, huh, I'm not exactly all there if I use Road Monster for too long, ya see. He tapped the side of his head for emphasis. After about 10, 15 minutes or so, it starts affecting my mind, so I gotta be careful with it. That's why I prefer not us in it unless absolutely necessary. Ah, I get ya. Bulkhead nodded. Well, I'll keep that in mind, then. We all will. Kyoka piped up from the side as her group approached the two, now that the conflict was over. But hey, let's celebrate. We actually won. Jazz nudged his head over toward the Energon on the mountain. Yep. Energon secured, cons are gone, and, hey, I can't believe I'm saying this, but Jetfire's back. Bulkhead lit up in anticipation. Hey, yeah, where is Jets, anyways? I was hoping to see him around here, but we lost track of him. Yes, Windblade flew after him as well with Kriti. Jinx added, have they been this way? C-H-Y-O-O-O-O-O-M. As if in direct response, a loud, thunderous noise echoed through the mountain range once again causing everyone to bring their hands over their ears. Gah, not again. Kyoka grit her teeth and her eyes went skyward, where she saw Jetfire and Windblade in an aerial dogfight against Skybite and Thundercracker. Oh boy, I might have been a bit quick on the draw when I said this was over. Comma dot dot. Up in the air, Izuku was, actually starting to get a bit excited. At first, he hadn't been too keen on all of this high-speed flying, but the longer their chase went on, the more thrilled he felt about it. 
Every time Jetfire managed to pull off a maneuver, bobbing and weaving cleanly around incoming fire from the Decepticons, it let out a burst of serotonin that Izuku didn't know he needed. This, felt like freedom. The sky was literally the limit to what they could do up here, and he was there for it. Ha ha ha. This, is amazing. I know, right. Jetfire affirmed, performing a sharp upturn to avoid a pair of incoming missiles. I had a feeling you'd get a kick out of this, Zuku. However, as he executed the move, Jetfire took notice of the new arrival to their dance with the cons, and it was a vehicle mode that he knew all too well. Wait a nano-click, Windblade, that you. Sky Commander. Windblade called in through her comlink as she fired at Skybite and Thundercracker from behind, zooming past them as they were forced to transform. It's good to see you online. Just then, a certain other voice piped up over the comms, Deku. Are you there? Over. H hey, Kriti. Izuku responded. This is Deku, reading you loud and clear. Over. A sigh came from the creation user. Ha, huh, good, I'm glad you're okay. How did you even get up here, anyway? Glancing through Jetfire's canopy, Izuku furrowed his brow at Skybite. A certain flying shark almost had me for lunch. But Jetfire came in at just the right time. Guilty as charged. Jetfire claimed as he and Windblade flew in tandem with one another, the duo steadily slowing down in midair. Let's pump the air brakes a bit and get our bearings, huh? On that note, they both transformed and hovered over to one another, holding their respective humans in their hands. Ha, huh, been a long time since I've seen any other Autobot. Who would have guessed I'd end up on the same planet as Team Prime? Windblade chuckled and extended her free hand, grasping Jetfires firmly. HMHM, HM, it's almost like you never left. Welcome back. Thanks, but I think it's time we wrap this up. The Sky Commander nudged his chin over to Skybite and Thundercracker, who were coming in hot. We've still got those two to deal with, after all. He took Windblade's hand and gently placed Izuku down in her palm, much to the boy's confusion. Zuku, I'm handing ya off to Windy for a sec. I'm gonna finish what I started. What do you plan on doing? Izuku asked. As Jetfire turned around, though, the large bot peered over his shoulder, giving the one for all user a thumbs up. Hehe, <laughs> you'll see. It'll be a blast. Just remember, watch my back. If anything, that only left Izuku even more perplexed as Jetfire zoomed toward the two Decepticons, but it was then that he noticed something he hadn't before. Ironically enough, it was on Jetfire's back, and it seemed to be a slot of some sort. It was situated between his two thrusters, with a tiny arrow on it as if to signify that something went in there. What the? Windblade seemed to notice this as well, and while she couldn't quite put her finger on it, this was starting to ring a bell in her head. He's got a plan, but just to be sure, let's back off a bit. Jetfire. Skybite exclaimed, thrusting a finger out at the Autobot with a snarl in his voice. This has gone on for too long between us. Today, it ends. With a series of dynamic poses, he made his intentions clear, I will destroy you, retrieve the Energon, and go back to Cybetron as a hero to all Decepticon kind. Mark my words, all. Oh, blah, blah, blah. The Autobot jet opened and closed his hand mockingly. All yav done these past few eons is yap my audio receptors off about the same. Damn. Thing. Get some original material, would ya? Sheesh. His sights zeroed in on the Sharktacon as his tone grew more serious. But no, you're not gonna do all that, Skybite. Instead, you're gonna get what's coming to ya. You and Megatron. Thundercracker raised his hand and the aerial assault team reformed into the Cybercolliber, returning to his grasp with its blade glowing brightly. Sorry, Jets, but just because you and my brother were friends, that doesn't mean we're gonna let you off easy. So come on, give it your best shot. I intend to. With those three words, all of a sudden, Jetfire's entire body began to glow, a bright red energy coursing through him as he balled his fists, threw his head back and yelled straight to the heavens. H H A A A A A A A A A G H. Whoa! Izuku exclaimed, he and Momo shielding their eyes as intense light ignited from Jetfire's very being. What the hell is going on? It was then that Windblade's optics widened, seeing the energy start to collect in the center of Jetfire's chest before shooting straight up into the sky. No, it couldn't be. High above, the darkening clouds began to swirl around, 
and from the very center of the forming vortex, a small, yet very bright fragment of light came rushing right back down toward Jetfire. This fragment, however, had a definite shape to it, made out of pure, solid energy. It was pointed at the sides and top, with a large, squared-off piece jutting out the bottom, almost as if it were a key of some sort. The squared part then flew straight into the slot on Jetfire's back, with the rest of the fragment flowing in after. And then, something astonishing happened. The two thrusters on Jetfire's back each split in half down the middle, revealing a pair of large, black, hidden cannons that extended out to form a set of rail guns. Feeling the energy coursing through him once again, Jetfire pitched back and struck his own battle-ready pose, shouting. Jetfire. Cyber key power. No one could believe what they had just seen, least of all the Cybertronians. WW what was that? Skybite stammered. Not enough to save him. Thundercracker rebuked, surging forward to swing the Cybercaliber at the Autobot. However, it wasn't until he saw the rail guns charging up did the Seeker realize, he was woefully in over his head about this. Is that supposed to scare me, Thundercracker? Pumping his arms before lurching his whole body forward, Jetfire let loose an incredible twin beam attack that struck Thundercracker, though not immediately. The Blue Seeker had tried to stave off the blast by blocking it with his sword, but the energy was far too much for the mini cons, who were forced to break off which left Thundercracker to get hit. The scorched Decepticon screamed in agony as he was sent hurtling into the mountainside, which left Skybite as the sole Decepticon standing. And he was horrified. He had no idea that his old foe was keeping, whatever that was under wraps. But, one looked to the aerial Savon, and he could see that Jetfire was not kidding around. Even as the twin rail guns shifted back to the normal thrusters, he was still extremely intimidating. So, what do you say to that, Skybite? With a hard swallow, Skybite hastily radioed back to the dark side as he retrieved his fellow Decepticon. Skybite to base, mission failed. Requesting ground bridge. You are so dead when you get here. Nitrous said plainly. Duly noted. With Skybite hefting Thundercracker over his shoulder while the aerial assault team flew straight to the opening portal, he scowled back at Jetfire, using every ounce of courage he had to make a decent threat. We will meet again, Jetfire. And soon. Sure. Jetfire jerked a thumb to him. Now get out of here. With one final huff, Skybite flew through the ground bridge and it closed behind him, allowing Jetfire to relax and let out a heavy sigh. Pa, phew. Well, glad we got all that cleared up. Powering his jets down, he, along with Windblade, both steadily landed where B, Jazz, Bulkhead and the others were gathered, placing his hands on his hips as they cheered for him. Ha ha ha. Now, now, no need to make a big fuss. I was just doing what any Autobot would do. Well, forgive us for wanting to welcome ya back. Bulkhead approached Jetfire with a raised fist, which the white and red bot was more than happy to reciprocate. As the two bumped fists, though, this allowed the humans to really take in just how big Jetfire was. He wasn't humongous or anything, but Bulkhead came up to his waist. Meaning that he was unequivocally the largest Cybertronian they had seen so far. Haha, how's it going, Jets? Been a long time. Jetfire laughed and nodded to him. Haha, you know it, Bulk. And as you can see, I picked up some new tricks in the time I was gone. Jazz and B approached them next, wanting to know more about it. Ha, huh, yeah, no kidding. You were lit up like a solar flare. Jazz threw his hands into the air, emphasizing his point. What was that, Jets? A cyber key. The familiar tone of Optimus Prime brought everyone's attention to him as he strolled over, his optics not leaving his second in command as he explained. A tiny fragment of Primus power that only a trained few can summon. It supplies them a temporary increase in power, and as you just saw, can even create new weapons. It is quite a sight to behold, he craned his head up to Jetfire, the Autobot commander's head just reaching the canopy on the taller bot's chest, before extending his hand. Ha, huh, but more to the point, it's very good to see you again, Jetfire. You came just in the nick of time. With a dutiful salute, Jetfire said, thanks, just doing my job, sir before extending his hand down to shake the primes. And it's good to see you, too. Been looking forward to this day for almost a million solar cycles. I'm sure. But that leads me to ask, what happened to you? 
A breathy chortle escaped Jetfire as his faceplate retracted, revealing a knowing, self-confident smirk. He he he, well, Prime, have I got a story for you. Chapter 62, A Jet's Resolve. Comma dot dot. Following the bottle's conclusion, Optimus had ordered everyone to return to headquarters, seeing that as the easiest way to regroup. Thankfully, Strongarm, Springer and the others had already reconvened with the rest of G.I. Joe, Gang Orca, Crust and the children, so bringing their group back was of no issue to Red Alert. At present, however, the Autobots were all waiting with bated breath as their medic worked to bring back Prime's group, and needless to say, the bots were all incredibly antsy. Well, most of them, at least. Springer resigned himself to leaning against a rock with his mini-cons laying at his feet, all while everyone else paced around in excitement. Or in Flare Up's case, dash around the entire field like she was being chased down by a Decepticon jet. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. She abruptly stopped in front of Sunstreaker, taking him off guard as she reached up and shook him by the shoulders. Can you believe it? Jetfire. It's actually Jetfire. I I I no, Flare. The yellow Lambo brother asserted. Trust me, I I saw him, too. We all did, R.C. said with awe, shaking her head. And never in a thousand years did I think he would have survived that. Sideswipe, however, thought otherwise. R.C., I get where you're coming from, but we really should have saw it coming. He thrust his hands up for emphasis. I mean, it's Jetfire. The best flyer the Autobots have ever seen. It's no wonder he managed to make it out of that supernova. Down below, the humans all listened intently as they described the bot, with Hawk speaking up for all of them. Ha, huh, sounds to me like you value this Jetfire pretty highly in your ranks. Is he that good? That good, that good. Sideswipe bent over, getting his face right in front of the general. He's better than, that good. He's amazing. Very rarely do I agree with Sideswipe, but in this instance, he's right on the Shanix. Strongarm nodded wholeheartedly. Jetfire is the whole package and more. He's won the Autobots so many battles over the Eons, Pax Volana, Tarn, the Inferno Pit, his track record is astonishing. Gotta admit, he's one heck of a warrior from the scuttlebutt I've heard. Springer piped up, walking over to the group with Sabak and Fangblade at his side. Granted, I've never seen him in action personally, but from the sounds of it, he'd make one slag in good wrecker. Arizer was particularly astounded by all of the praise being thrown around about the new arrival, her optics gleaming with curiosity. Oh my, now I'm very much looking forward to meeting him. She rubbed her chin thoughtfully. Perhaps he could even give me some tips on how to maneuver through the air better in robot mode. Mina, Ajiro and the rest of the students were all beaming with anticipation as well. Wow, this Jeffire guy sounds totally badass. Mina cheered. I know. Ajiro pumped his legs up and down. You guys are getting me properly hyped. Duke couldn't help but chuckle at the kid's enthusiasm. Hee hee, well, if anything, I hope he uses that jet mode he scanned properly. After all, the Sky Striker's a work of art. Would hate to see any version of it get dinged up. Sunstreaker quickly waved those fears away. Oh, you don't have to worry about that. There's very few who've been able to touch Jetfire in the sky, let alone outfly him. Huh, same can be said about our best pilot, Ace. Scarlet pointed out. Though I guess now, Jetfire's managed to outfly, I am. Ah, I'm sure Ace won't mind much. Wild Bill brushed off. Guy's a good sport. But speaking of flying, he nodding up to Springer and saluted. Boy, that was one hell of a good time we had out there, wasn't it? Haha, ha, I don't think I've had that much fun behind the stick in years. The triple changer gave a laugh of his own, pulling out a thumbs up to the cowboy. Bill, I think your own words say it best, yeah. The duo shared a laugh before Springer knelt down and offered a fist. You can be my wingman anytime, my friend. Orca and Crust had walked up to Hawk as well, the former extending his hand. In general, it's been an honor for us to work with you and your team. I hope our paths cross again in the future. Indeed, Crust exclaimed, thrusting a hand up to the sky. Truly, this will be a team up worth repeating at some point. Ha ha, oh, I don't doubt it, gentlemen. Hawk shook Orca's hand while Duke did the same with Crust. I'm glad that we could work with some local heroes while on our extended stay, 
he craned his head over to Mina, Eijiro, Denki, Tetsu and Setsuna as well. Along with a few future prospects, too. Ah, shucks. Setsuna gave a cheeky smile. It was nothing, really, general. Tetsu Tetsu stood at attention and gave a salute. Yeah, we were just doing what we thought would impress all of you guys. Ha, huh, well, keep it up then. Kamakura encouraged, the man having reverted to his normal form when they returned. I'm sure all of you will make for some great heroes one day. Tiger Claw agreed wholeheartedly. Hem, yes. Just be sure to listen to your teachers, alright. He got a collective, EHH, from the teens, making the Tiger Man roll his eyes. Don't give me that. They may enforce rules, but they're only trying to keep you all safe as they cultivate you into good future heroes. Keep up with your studies, stay in school, and remember. No one is half the battle. Scarlet exclaimed, before taking out a small recording device from her back pocket and hitting the play button. G.I. J.O.O.O.O.E. But all that did was make the teens stare at her in dumbfounded confusion, all while Tiger Claw deflated. Oh. I wanted to say it. Scarlet spun the recorder in her hand and pocketed it once again. Sorry, TC, but ya gotta be quicker than that. Ah, more to the point, what the heck did you just do? Denki asked. Oh, she just played an excerpt from the official, G.I. Joe, theme song. Duke explained, all while Snake Eyes shook his head in exasperation next to him. It's a classic, honestly. Made during when the first G.I. Joe Team was a more public figure back in the day. We only play it when someone says that phrase, though. What? Knowing is half the battle. Setsuna asked, which prompted Scarlet to pull the recorder out again. G.I. J-O-O-O-O-E. The lizard tail splitter user grimaced toward the redheaded woman, narrowing her eyes while Scarlet smiled sheepishly. Okay. We get the picture. Scarlet slunk away with the recorder close to her chest, lowering her head apologetically. Hawk chuckled and waved his hand. Aha, uh -huh, it's just a little inside joke amongst the ranks. Just then, the general noticed something moving out the corner of his eye, shifting his focus back toward the base. That said, I think the guest of honor is about to show himself. Everyone set their sights onto the base's entrance, where Optimus, Bumblebee, Jazz, Windblade and Bulkhead all emerged. Walking ahead of them were Izuku, Kyoka, Momo Shoto, Roadblock, Jinx and Mackenzie, along with Edgeshot, who was carrying Mirko in his arms with a deadpan stare. Marissa was currently using her quirk on the rabbit hero's legs, though the woman herself didn't seem to be in agony. If anything, she was as lively as ever. Heya, guys. Mirko thrust her hand into the air, waving toward them. You'll never guess what happened. I'll bet we won't. Denki said dumbfoundedly. I kicked through five layers of con armor. Ahahaha. As Mirko cackled at her victory, though, Izuku didn't seem all that impressed, eyeing his mentor with a tired gaze. At this point, I'm honestly not surprised you'd do something like this, Mirko. Ah, kid, you gotta lighten up a little. Mirko reached up and ruffled his hair a bit. Here I thought I'd rub off more on ya over the week. Well, you did. Izuku stressed though maybe not entirely in the most positive of ways. Mirko just scoffed and flicked her hair at him. pff Come on kid, ya know ya love me. Izuku became big red at that and he quickly hid his face, mumbling to himself about how unfair that move was. Ha ha ha. Sheesh, can't ya take a, ow. Edge shot abruptly dropped Mirko, putting his hands behind his back while raising his chin up. HMPH, that'll be enough from you. Edge shot. Marissa chided. Her legs are still broken. Much to their surprise, however, Mirko just shot a thumbs up. It's okay. She winced out. Edgy boy here knows how to test my tolerances. Ha ha. Multiple veins could be seen popping out of Edge Shot's forehead, but even so, he managed to keep his cool demeanor. I think I should schedule a vacation soon. Stepping over to her mentor, Momo bowed and ushered him to follow her. Master, why don't we step away from the cause of your headache, hem. The duo made their way over to the other group as the creation user smiled to her friends. Everyone, I assume you all made it out unharmed. We're still standing, yao momo. Mina affirmed, though we were ready to go down in a blaze of glory. Thankfully, Roller and the Minicons arrived just in time to snap us back to our senses. 
Crust rubbed the back of his head with a sheepish grin. Hey, imagine what your school would say if we all just up and died in that battle. Denki gave his own nervous laugh. Haha, yeah, knowing Mr. Aizawa, he'd probably find some way to revive both of you just so he could kill you himself. I wouldn't put it past him. Gang Orku lowered his head. I myself got caught up in the moment as well, so I am not without blame. All the same, he set his sights up to Optimus Prime. But regardless, where's the bot of the hour? I thought he'd be right behind you. The Autobot leader directed his head back toward the base's entrance. Jetfire is still inside, speaking with red alert. I'm sure that they'll be out. Guys. All at once, everyone's attention was brought to Mei as she jogged out of the base, with red alert slowly bringing up the rear. This. Guy. Is. Amazing. She exclaimed, throwing her arms out at her sides. He's the biggest bot I've ever seen. So sleek, so aerodynamic, and that jetpack. Ah. I'm freaking out. The young inventor's friends all wore amused smiles at her response to Jetfire, with Kyoka scratching her cheek. Why'd I have a feeling that'd be her first reaction? So, where is he? Suddenly too shy or something. Ha! Huh. Far from it. Red alert denied, showing a rare smile. He's just, having some difficulty getting used to the size of everything. Clunk. Gah. Clang. Do. Geez, eventually, Jetfire had made his way out of the base, and the team immediately picked up on what Red meant by what he said. Even taking the twin jet thrusters sticking up from behind his head into account, Jetfire was way too tall to fit through the base's exit comfortably. And even then, the scaffolding and beams along the ceiling were getting in his way. He had to bend over just to walk out, but once he made it, he returned to his full height and let out a relieved sigh. Ha! Huh, phew! Sheesh, this is where you guys are hiding, out. You sure there wasn't an option that had higher ceilings? Momo bowed her head again. Apologies, but this was the biggest place my family owned that was abandoned. If I had known a bot like you would come around, Jetfire, we probably would have considered more options. Ah, it's fine, I'm just poking, fun. Watch this. The tail fins of his vehicle mode rearranged to that they were lower behind his head, and on top of that, the two thrusters both rotated back down to their orientation for his vehicle mode, essentially taking off 10 extra feet of height from his back. See, I can just bring my thrusters down indoors. No worries. As his thrusters returned to their regular position, the Sky Commander couldn't help but ponder, though it's gonna be a pretty tight squeeze if a bot like Sky Lynx comes around. Haha, ha. I can already see him complaining about how, this domicile doesn't even begin to accompany my unbridled glory. I demand that we move at once. Or something. Ha ha ha. Bulkhead let out a laugh and slapped Jetfire on the back at his joke. You're so right, Jets. Ha, man, it's good having ya back. Jetfire. Sideswipe and Sunstreaker rushed up to the tall Autobot excitedly, with everyone else bringing up the rear. I is it really you? The red Lambo brother beamed. Bending forward, Jetfire clasped the twins' shoulders, bringing them to a halt. Hey hey. Sides, Sunny, good to see you too, and, whoa. He was suddenly cut off when, from out of nowhere, Flare Up blinked up onto his shoulders and wrapped her arms around his neck in an energetic hug. Ah, haha, I thought I spotted you zipping around down below, Flare. E e e e e. Jets, it really is you. I shoulda known y'all wouldn't, they gone out that easily. The scout squeed delightfully. Reaching up to procure her from his shoulder, Jetfire chuckled as he set her down. Haha, ha, well, what can I say? I'm just full of, surprises. He nodded down to Strongarm and RC as they caught up as well. Cadet, see, glad to see you're still around, too. RC gave a two-fingered salute to him, while Strongarm gave her standard salute. Right back at ya, Jetfire. Okay, now Spill, where in the universe have you been over these past eons? Ah, still as straight to the point as ever. Jetfire raised his hands. Can't I get a moment to take in the fresh atmosphere? I've been flying round space for at least 10 decacycles. And besides, I've got so many new faces to meet. He set his sights over to Springer and Erizer in particular. Like you two. You guys renew, though I do recognize one of ya. He approached the triple changer, nudging his chin to him. You're the ragtag wrecker, Springer, right? This made Springer smirk and he instantly offered his hand. Hey, seems like my reputation precedes me, even in the higher ranks. 
Jetfire reciprocated the handshake with a laugh. Ha ha. Well, with how often Magnus yammered onto me about you being a loose cannon, how could I not know about ya? PFF, that stiff couldn't deal with me if he tried. I know. Why do you think I kept pestering him about it? The duo shared a laugh at that before Jetfire moved on to Erizer, having to crane his head down quite a bit to meet her optics. In you, you're a maximal. Hey, haven't come across many of your kind in my travels. What's your name, miss? Erizer offered him a salute. Erizer, reporting for duty. It's a pleasure to meet you, sir. Ha, huh, at ease, ma'am. Jetfire reached down, daintily taking her hand in his and giving a dramatic bowing. The pleasure's all mine. Just then, however, Strongarm cleared her throat, bringing Jetfire's attention back to the main topic. Ahem. With all due respect, Jetfire, sir, you really owe us all an explanation. Strongarm reasoned. No one just survives a supernova and lives without telling that tale. Optimus came forward at the cadet's remark, agreeing with her. Indeed, Jetfire. There are still many questions I have for you myself. The Autobot Jet let out a sigh and rubbed his helm, knowing that he wasn't about to get out of it. Ha, huh, yeah, fair enough, Prime, he trailed off as he noticed the rest of the humans gathered around him, heroes, students and Joes alike, their eyes all full of curiosity. But can I at least get the introductions out of the way first? I've got a lot of names to remember here and not just be 127. Beast Beast. Jetfire automatically spun around and placed his hands together, bowing toward the little yellow bot. Sorry, sorry. Bumblebee. B gave a buzz of approval, along with a happy thumbs up. Several minutes later, once introductions were out of the way, Jetfire and the others went down to the beach, where the tall Autobot had taken a seat on a sizable boulder. Rubbing his hands together, he prepared himself, knowing that they'd be there for a while. Okay. So, introductions are out of the way, he pointed out to the group. And I'm pretty sure that I got, at least 90% of your names memorized. That earned him a chuckle from most of the humans, to which he raised a hand. So please, don't be offended if I call ya by a nickname, I tend to remember those better. That was something that May wasn't bothered by in the least. Hey, ya know what? Same, feel free to call us anything. I knew I liked ya, crazy eyes. Jetfire pointed double finger guns at May, to which she winked and did the same. But now, let's get down to business. Because I know my fellow Autobots won't stop pestering me, till I give a proper explanation. You know it. Jazz popped a squat on the ground, crisscrossing his legs as Kyoka sat next to him. So, spill the beans, Jets. What have you been up to for the past million solar cycles? Windblade leaned forward intently. And how were you not destroyed back then? Jetfire took a deep intake of air, ready to recount his tale. Well, I guess there's no better place to start than where we left off with each other. He craned his head up toward the bright, blue sky, pulling the recalling that day from his memory banks. As you know, Skybite managed to lure me into that dying son's neighborhood, saying that he had a minicon held hostage. Of course, that turned out to be a lie. And well, let's just say that getting out of there wasn't as easy as one might think. Comma dot dot. One million years ago, if there was one thing that Jetfire couldn't stand more than Decepticons, it was being tricked by one of them. And unfortunately, this was one of the rare instances where he did. Skybite had successfully lured him into Cybertron's neighboring solar system, which, while mostly underpopulated, was still the home of a mighty red sun, which was about to become a dwarf star. Thankfully, the residents of the solar system's one inhabited planet were advanced enough to evacuate on spaceships before the big kaboom, but if he wanted to get out of there, he needed to hurry the frag up. Come on, come on, gotta get into calm range. Jetfire grumbled to himself. Gur, this is why we shouldn't have shut down the space bridge network. For what felt like the millionth time, he attempted communication. Autobot forces, this is Jetfire, come in. T-C-H-Z-Z-Z-Z, Jetfire. T-C-H-Z-Z, do ya, T-S-C-H-Z, hear me. A feeling of hope leapt up in Jetfire's spark. Finally, a reply. I Ironhide, do you copy? T-C-H-Z-Z-Z, we're tracking, T-S-C-H-Z, going nearly, T-S-C-H-Z, eat of sound. What the scrap, re-ya, T-S-Chiz. 
I I can barely hear you, buddy, I. Chia Kum. All at once, that single, deafening sound made Jetfire's spark drop down into his gut, seeing nothing but a bright, white light encompassing his vision. Frag. Still, he kept flying as fast as he could. He was almost at the edge of the solar system, he wasn't about to give up now. No. Gotta keep going. I, can, make it. Putting his thrusters on full blast, Jetfire gave one final push, right as the shockwave from the exploding sun slammed into him, propelling him forward while also dealing significant damage. Triple A Aug. As he was forced into his now incredibly mutilated robot mode, Jetfire was propelled into the vastness of space, slipping into stasis lock as his comm signal was cut off. Along with it, his Autobot insignia darkened, his indicator was also disabled. All he could do, was hurtle through the dark void of space. Comma dot dot. Present day. Admittedly, not my finest moment. Jetfire conceded. Optimus hummed solemnly. When the solar system finally calmed down, searched the entire vicinity for any remnants of your body, we always did find it strange that there didn't seem to be any. He set his optics upon his friend. But now, it makes sense why. You were thrown halfway across the entire galaxy. Denki exclaimed in awe, and managed to survive the whole way. Dude, that's amazing. Mina nodded in agreement. Yeah, you must be really durable to live through that. Jetfire rubbed his head with a slight chuckle. Ha, huh, well, ah, uh, not to toot my own horn, but I have lived through countless scrapes in the past. Windblade leaned forward intently. But then what happened? It's obvious that you were repaired after that, but where'd you end up? Not many planets outside of Cybertron's colonies know how to properly repair us, after all. Hee <laughs> hee, well, that's where some interesting coincidences started happening for me, Jetfire continued, setting his back against the rocky crag. Like you said, I didn't go floating through space for very long. Otherwise, my spark would have gone out after several megacycles. But, the blast from the supernova was powerful enough to send me into a different solar system. And that's when I finally made planetfall, kinda. Comma dot dot. The sound of droning beeps were the first thing to grace Jetfire's audio receptors as he regained consciousness, only for him to wake up with a start. Ah. Lurching into an upright position, the Autobot jet began breathing hard and fast, his optics snapping every which way around to try and figure out where he was. WW what's going on? What is this? He was in a very sterile, wild room, surrounded by medical equipment on all sides. That didn't help at all. Where the slag am I, ow? Jetfire, at ease. The shock of being forced back down onto the medical slab was what knocked Jetfire back to his senses, allowing him to intake steadily. It was then, however, that he took notice of WHO had slammed him down. It was a mostly black and gray Autobot, built very blocky with a vented chest. He had silver and blue detailing throughout, mainly in his head which was rounded at the top with a silver faceplate and blue visor staring back at him. Jetfire could hardly believe who he was seeing. Cerebros. Welcome back to the land of the living, my friend. Cerebros greeted, taking his hand off of Jetfire's chest. You had us worried for a considerable amount of time. WW what the, Jetfire lifted himself up, much slower and more deliberate this time. He took another glance around the room, recognizing the Cybertronian technology. Am, am I in? Fortress Maximus. The Autobot scientist affirmed, clapping his hands for the nearby windows to be opened. When they were, they led in a bright light, which made Jetfire raise a hand to cover his optics. But once they adjusted, he saw that they were overlooking a sprawling, high-tech cityscape, where countless vehicles were flying around every which way. Welcome to Nebulos. Cerebros finished. I, ha, holy scrap. Jetfire approached the window, seeing that Cybertronians were interacting with smaller, bipedal, green-skinned aliens with white hair down below. So this is where you took your civilians. Cerebros approached Jetfire from behind, hands behind his back. Indeed. After Optimus Prime ordered nearly all Titans to evacuate the planet with the innocents, my large friend and I found this secluded planet. The inhabitants were already highly advanced, but were in a time of peace. The scientist lowered his head a bit. At first, they were rather hostile to our presence, but Fort Max and I earned their trust eventually by promising them that we would drive off the Cybertronian war should it ever come to this planet. 
As much as Jetfire wanted to see the positives in that, he was too steeped in thinking about what had happened. He had only just barely managed to make it out of that supernova, while Skybite made a clean getaway. At least, as far as he knew. Kinda hoppin, he at least got damaged in that blast too, honestly. Before he could get too lost in his thoughts, though, Cerebros tapped him on the shoulder. Jetfire, are you listening? WW wa. Oh, sorry, I, I was thinking about. Hem, we detected the supernova not long before you arrived. Cerebros nodded. I assume that's the reason you were so damaged. Jetfire tightened his fists. Yeah, a con called Skybite managed to trick me into it. With that, he spun away from the window and began skulking over toward the door. Thanks for the patch up, but I've gotta get back out there and find that yellow plated pred. However, Cerebros hastily went to reach out to him. Jetfire, wait, please, stay here. The Autobot jet did an about face, wearing an incredulous expression. I know, I know, the war is important, but I implore you to stay. With your background, you would be of much help here. PFF, what? As a scientist, you know full well I left that life a long time ago. Was never suited for it. Then at least stay until you're fully capable of space flight again. There's still several repairs that you desperately need before you can be airborne again. Taking his words into consideration, Jetfire gave a reluctant sigh, slumping his shoulders a bit. Ha, huh, alright, fine, I'll stick around. But only until I can fly again. Ha, huh, thank you, Jetfire. Cerebros bowed his head as Jetfire sat back down on the repair table. Trust me, when it comes to Fort Max, we have the best repair and medical crews. Just then, the door opened and revealed a new pair walking in. An Autobot and a Nebulon. The bot had a mainly silver torso with blue limbs and a square, blue head, its visor glowing a bright white. Also, sticking out of his shoulders was a red gun barrel, with another black gun barrel jutting out of each of his wrists. The Nebulon, on the other hand, was like all the others, green skin and white hair, though he wore a pair of red pants, black boots and a white doctor's coat. Oh, speaking of which, Cerebros nodded to the duo. Ah, I see our patients awake. The Autobot stated, giving Jetfire a nod. Long time no see, Jets. Ha, huh. Cog. Jetfire extended a hand and the two shared a handshake. Man, aren't you a sight for sore optics? He craned his head down to the Nebulon. So, guessing you've employed some Nebulans here, too, E.H. Cerebros knelt down and waved a hand toward the young alien. Indeed. Jetfire, allow me to introduce Haikyuu. He's a young one, but he certainly learns fast. Jetfire sent the young one a salute. Sup, kid. And then Haikyuu opened his mouth. Good day, mate. He returned, taking Jetfire aback by just how strange his voice was. Crikey, did you, Avenue 1 gnarly tumble into our atmosphere? Covered head to toe in space barnacles, ya were. B, don't worry, we scrapped every last ona, those ankle biters off a ya. He went over to a storage tank on the other side of the room and opened it, revealing the grayish purple parasites all stored inside. And, ho ho, they won't go to waste, let me tell ya. Gonna fry em up on the Barbie and Bob's or uncle. Gonna, Avenue ourselves a real rip snorta, with these, fair dinkum. All Jetfire could do was stare at the Nebulon in stunned silence, slowly craning his head back to Cerebros all the while. Did they all talk like this? Yes. I want off this planet. ASAP. Comma dot dot. Izuku couldn't help but stare at Jetfire incredulously, is that really what they sounded like? Jetfire shuddered as he recollected that memory. Ah, uh, yeah, no exaggeration on that part, Zuku. And, much to my horror, a lot of Cybertronian civilians had already picked up the Nebulon accent, too. He shook his head vehemently. And I was not about to stick around long enough to start sounding like that, no sir. Sheesh, sounds terrifying. Bulkhead commented. Sounds like Space Australia. Kyoka added. So yeah, terrifying. RC rolled her optics and got back on topic. So, you landed on the same planet as Cerebros and Fort Max. Well, good to know that they're at least doing okay by the sounds of things. Optimus gave an affirming nod. Indeed, it was my hope that many of the Titans and their city speakers would be able to find peace throughout the galaxy. I am glad that was the case with those two, especially considering Cerebros' pacifist nature. Still, 
he tilted his head. But, if you made contact with him, why did you not try to contact Cybertron? A sigh escaped the Autobot jet as he leaned forward. Because I didn't want to. At the time, my main focus was finding Skybite and finishing the job. Once I'd get that done, I promised myself I would go back, make it a big surprise, you know. Even made Cerebro's promise he wouldn't even attempt to tell anyone. All the same, he didn't seem too thrilled recalling that. But thinking back on it, probably wasn't my best idea. So, what came next for you if you didn't stay on Nebulon? Shoto asked. Well, half and half, next came a pretty dark time. Jetfire said with a hesitant tone. I'd honesty rather skip over this part, but for a while, I was fueled by nothing other than vengeance and anger. Anger at Skybite, anger at any con that just so happened to cross my path. I'd blow up con outposts so quick, they wouldn't even get a chance to call for help. Looking back, I was, pretty callous for an Autobot during that time. But then, I came upon a planet to rest on for a bit, where I found another group of Cybertronians. This caught the Autobots, interest fairly quick. Another uncolonized planet, Strongarm inquired. Yep, yeah, but this time, what I found weren't Autobots. You familiar with the circle of light? All at once, several jaws fell open. You're joking, Red Alert uttered. You couldn't have found. But Jetfire nodded to him. Hey, yep, yeah, die Atlas. Well, more like he found me. And let me tell ya, I was not happy on the planet that his people found, not at first, anyway. Comma dot dot. Ah ah. Jetfire let loose a volley of rage-fueled laser fire toward a rocky outcropping on the planet of Theophany, directly above the Cybertronian settlement that the Circle of Light called home. This city, which they had apparently dubbed, New Crystal City, was underground, but even then, he could no doubt tell that people would be hearing him beneath the surface as he threw his tantrum. He was just, so, angry. Be it at Skybite, Starscream, Megatron, or even himself. With all of his energy and firepower spent, Jetfire fell to his knees, intaking air at a heavy pace as he slammed his fists against the ground. He had felt this way for a long, long time over the past several millennia, and each day only brought more and more anger with it. I'm, I'm reaching my limit, he admitted to himself. I, I don't want. You wish not to be angry anymore. Jetfire gasped and rounded about on his intruder, only to be met with a bot much bigger than himself. Both figuratively and literally. Oh oh, die Atlas. It's just you. No bot could ever guess that the mountain of colorful metal that was die Atlas was a pacifist by nature, especially given his alternate mode. A treaded battleship with a wingspan that was at least double Jetfire's own. He stood several heads taller than Jetfire as well. His red, blue, yellow, white and black color scheme making him stand out amongst the arid, rocky planet. Die Atlas, Blue Helm also had three horns sticking out of it, one on either side and another directly on top, all jutting back toward the drill-like nose cone of his vehicle mode that stuck up from his back. But even with his imposing stature, Jetfire knew that this bot wouldn't hurt even the smallest of Insecticons. You seem troubled, my friend. Die Atlas strolled over and sat down next to Jetfire, who simply stared back at him. Since your arrival on Theophany, all you have done is blow up mountain ranges. Yeah, sorry about that. Jetfire sighed, rubbing his neck. It's just, gah, I have no clue what to do with all this pent-up anger. Skybite's still out there, but every which way I follow him, he always manages to give me the slip. Hmm, yes. I can see where your frustration stems from, but I can also tell that you do not wish to feel this way. Dai Atlas reached out and placed his hand gently upon Jetfire's shoulder. You wish to be free of your vices, to return to the way you once were, how many of us remember you from before. Jetfire shook his head. Not that simple, I think. Sure, people knew me as the Autobot High Flyer who did amazing stunts and outflew cons like it was no one's business. But, I don't know if I even can go back to throwing quips around and being the, cool guy. Even if I destroy Sky Bite, I don't think that'll bring me peace. A smile worked its way to Die Atlas, face, nodding in approval. I am glad that you already recognize that, Jetfire. It certainly makes my job all the easier. The Autobot Jet did a double take as Die Atlas stood up. W wait, what? You said it yourself. You will not find peace with Skybite's destruction, 
but putting up a front of your former self for your comrades won't do you any good either. Dai Atlas put his hand up in front of his face, keeping it straight up as he closed his optics. What you must do is find balance within yourself. A jetfire who can use the negative rage that festers within to fuel a more positive disposition. He extended his other hand to him. And I believe that we can help you with that. What? You mean like, join the circle? Jetfire raised his hand in denial. Ah, I appreciate the offer, but I'm really not much of a swordsman. And besides, don't you and your people try to avoid conflict as much as possible? Dai Atlas gave a small nod. Yes, but we are prepared for it should we deem it necessary to fend off those who try and besiege our utopia. He opened his optics as his smile increased a little. But even then, I wasn't referring to training you to wield one of our signature great swords. No, I am referring to, something else. Something that I myself wield instead of a blade. Would you like to see? Admittedly, Jetfire's curiosity was piqued. E.H., what have I got to lose? Let's see it. I was hoping that would be your answer. Going back down to the ground, Dai Atlas sat in a cross-legged, meditative pose, pinching his thumb and index fingers together while keeping the others straight. Closing his optics once again, Dai Atlas began to focus, and before long, he was enveloped in a bright, golden light as he hummed in concentration. Ah! W what the, Jetfire could only watch as Dai Atlas began to float up into the air, without any need for his thrusters. High above, clouds began swirling into a large hole that opened up in the sky, where a golden light descended and inserted itself into a slot on Dai Atlas, back, and then it happened. Cyber Key Power The gold energy surrounding the large Cybertronian came bursting out all at once, while arm-shaped energy constructs emerged from Dai Atlas, very being. To Jetfire, the image resembled a giant, golden optic, with Dai Atlas himself serving as its pupil. And all the while, he felt, more at ease, as if the energy were helping to healing him in some way. Wah, what is? Gaze into the iris, Jetfire. Dai Atlas encouraged, the arm constructs moving in tandem with one another as they expelled the energy. Experience, tranquility. After a few more moments, the energy died down and Dai Atlas floated back down landing on his feet to the astoundment of Jetfire. So, what did you think? What did I think? I think that was amazing. Jetfire exclaimed. What was that? Dai Atlas chuckled as he explained. HMHM, that, my friend, was a cyber key. A tiny fragment of Primus power. It is said that every Cybertronian wants the capability of summoning one in the past, but as civilization progressed, the people forgot about this power. Now, only a select few know how to do it. He extended his hand to the Autobot jet. Would you like to learn? His optics going back and forth between the hand and Dai Atlas, welcoming expression, Jetfire let this all sink in, before making his choice. He reached out and shook Dai Atlas, hand. Yes. Please, teach me, master. Comma dot dot. And well, there you have it. Jetfire finished up. It took me a good, long while, but I was eventually able to summon my cyber key, as Dai Atlas taught me. After that, I left Theophany and continued my pursuit, which is when I promised myself that I'd bring Sky Bite in to face the justice he deserved. He clapped his hands together and thrust his arms out toward the group. And now, 300 years after the fact, here I am. The Autobot Jet's exclamation was met with stunned stares and jaws agape, the rest of his teammates still processing what they had just heard. The humans, meanwhile, were simply wide-eyed and silently taking it all in, though Kyoko was the one to break that silence. So, what you're saying is that you learned how to summon a super anime power-up by achieving enlightenment from a Cybertronian monk. Jetfire gave a so-so motion with his hand. Eh, less, enlightened, more, came to my senses, honestly. Also, what the heck is, anime? And never mind, I'll tell you later. Kyoko waved off. Jetfire, that is incredible. Optimus uttered, still surprised by the whole story. Not only did you find the circle of light, but you learned from the wisest Cybertronian I have had the privilege of meeting. The same one who helped drift, no less. Red Alert commented, giving Jetfire a nod. You're probably one of the luckiest bots to ever live. Surviving a supernova, landing on a planet that was occupied by a titan, stumbling across the circle of light. Jetfire raised a finger, cutting him off. And all while in hot pursuit of Skybite. 
Pretty crazy how an obsession like that can fuel a bot, but I've mellowed back out a bit, to say the least. Meanwhile, Bulkhead was still trying to take in the news of the Circle of Light's settlement. New Crystal City. He shook his head in disbelief. Ha, huh, I've gotta see this place someday. You'd like it, Bulk. Jetfire affirmed. They worked with what they had and what they came up with is gorgeous. It was then that Izuku raised his hand. Okay, so, question about Cyber Keys. If Dai Atlas was able to give him a healing aura, and yours gave you rail guns, does that mean that every bot's cyber key is different? Exact a mundo, Zuku. Pointing down to him, Jetfire explained further. A cyber key's abilities really depends on the bot that summons them. It could give you more offensive capabilities, be used for defense or support, heck, it could even enhance a bot's vehicle mode. It all depends on the bot and what their primary need in the moment is. The large Autobot stood up and turned around, showing off his thrusters. And for me, it was something to help me get out all of the pent-up aggression, hence my afterburner blasters, as I like to call them. Just then, Sideswipe and Sunstreaker clamored up to him, the duo whooping and hollering in excitement. Ooh, ooh, Jetfire, you've gotta show us how to do that. Sideswipe insisted. Yeah, it'd be so cool. Sunstreaker said, gesturing to himself all the while. After all, any cyber key I'd receive is bound to be just as tremendous as I am. Hee <laughs> hee, well boys, I wouldn't expect it to be an easy process. Jetfire asserted, moving back around and placing his hands to his hips. After all, it took me a good while before I was able to summon mine. It takes discipline, focus and most of all, hard work. He leaned down so that he was optic level with them. Think you guys can do something like that. Sideswipe scoffed and waved him off. PFF. Course we can. Hard work's something we can do while in stasis. Off to the side, Strongarm couldn't help but snicker to herself. SNRK, yeah, in his dreams, maybe. She whispered to Erizer, the duo laughing quietly to themselves. I heard that. Sideswipe snapped, whirling around to stomp his way towards Strongarm. I swear, I can't go one day without. Enough. Hawk suddenly shouted, making both of the young bots snap to attention. Do we really need to go through this again? Sir, no sir. The duo saluted. Hawk grumbled out, good. Before going back to Jetfire, craning his head up to the larger bot. Well, Jetfire, that was quite the story. Honestly, kinda put a lot of things in perspective for me. It's a big universe out there, and our little marble's only a small part of it. Duke. Scarlet and the other Joes all gathered up as well. Yeah, really hope we get to see some of it one day. The blonde, wolf-eared man said as he nodded toward his team. But for now, I think we've had enough adventure for one weekend. Yup, I'm pretty tuckered out myself after that battle. Roadblock agreed, putting his hand over his stomach. And I'm pretty famished, too. About time we get home so I can start on that beef stroganoff. Pointing up to Jetfire, Wild Bill made sure to add, just be careful handling that new alt. Moda, yours, got it. The Sky Striker's nothing to fool around with. Ha ha. Oh, don't you worry. Jetfire assured, I'm gonna be super careful with it and put it to good use. He gave a salute to the Joes. And thanks for letting me use it. Sorry that I didn't ask for permission first. Ah, it's alright, Jetfire. Scarlet shook her head. Besides, we're just Josh and ya a bit anyway. So, what's next fair ya, lad? Her question made the Sky Commander hum ponderously, scratching his chin in thought. Hum, what next? Well, since I'm sure Sky Bite probably revealed himself to Megatron by now if he's allied with Starscream, my guess is he's gonna be kept on this planet going forward. He balled his fists and placed them back on his hips, setting his gaze out to the team. So, by that logic, there's really only one thing I can do going forward, he extended his hand out to Optimus. If you'll have me, of course. Is that even a question? Prime rebutted, bringing his hand forward and firmly grasping his friends. Welcome back, old friend. We're happy to have you back. Jetfire nodded down to Prime in gratitude. Happy to be back, Prime. And trust me, I'm gonna pull my weight around here. You can guarantee that. A volley of cheers came from below, the UA students all happily celebrating the new addition to the team. Woohoo! Alright! Setsuna pumped a fist into the air. This team just keeps getting bigger and better.
That loser Starscream doesn't stand a chance. Her words gave Izuku pause, however, remembering a certain interaction with said Seeker during the battle. W wait a second, he set his sights back up to Jetfire, calling out to him. Jetfire, during the battle, you mentioned that you and Starscream were friends once. I'm guessing that was before the war broke out, right? Eh, well, yeah, technically. Jetfire rubbed his neck. Though for a time, he and I actually stayed friends while he was a Decepticon, namely because I was a con at one point, too. All at once, the group of humans, students, heroes and Joes alike, all wore flabbergasted expressions, their mouths falling open in shock. Did I forget to mention that? Yes. They all echoed, taking the Sky Commander aback. A-H. Okay, okay, I get ya. So yes, I was a Decepticon at one point. Though, to be fair, it was only for a couple hundred years, and it was before the war broke out. Jetfire pursed his lips, thinking back to that time. Back then, Megatron's movement was all about seeking equality for all Cybertronians. I felt restricted in my place in life, relegated to being a scientist because of my aerial alt. Mode. Me, a scientist. Can you imagine? Tetsu Tetsu shook his head. Nah, that definitely doesn't seem like where you fit in. But why were Jets automatically given scientist roles in the first place? Strongarm was the one to answer that question. Many believed it was because the founder of Functionism, Nova Prime, was afraid of bots who had aerial alt modes and thus placed them in positions where they caused the least amount of trouble. Jazz added on to that, same went for bots that had treaded alt modes and that included Megatron himself. Man, Functionism sounds like it sucks. A Jiro grimaced. I guess I could see why Megatron wanted to remove it, but, was an all-out war really necessary? I firmly believe that it was not, a Jiro. Optimus interjected. However, when Megatron was denied his vision of becoming the next Prime by the Council, he became bitter, and his ideologies twisted into what they are now. The Prime furrowed his metal brow as he faced the ocean, his mind going to the Decepticons' end of the situation. Right now, I doubt he is at all happy with the outcome of this battle. And I fear what we could see significant pushback as a result, sooner than later. Comma dot dot. Cybertron. Little did Optimus know that, in fact, said Decepticon leader had just finished being briefed on the bottle's conclusion, and he was far from impressed. In fact, he was disappointed, though he expected to be. Given everything that Unacronus had just told him, he had actually predicted quite a few things happening, such as Jetfire's sudden arrival. He knew the traitorous turncoat would arrive on the planet eventually in his pursuit of Skybite, and sure enough, it was at the exact day and time that they had planned for the operation to take place. It was no surprise to him that Jetfire's sudden appearance helped throw a wrench into things. However, that didn't stop things from being an absolute disaster in the first place. Sure, the Viacons outnumbered the Autobots and their human allies, but of all things, the fact that they had gotten the human military in on their side now was incredibly disconcerting. It was no wonder the Decepticons were eventually overwhelmed, aside from the fact that the supposed, specialists, he had assigned to this team were almost all completely inept in the battle. Though I suppose that owes more to these, G.I. Joes, bolstering the Autobots' forces and taking them off guard. He deduced. A quirk that can affect one's luck, an electrokinesis user, and a giant stone beast in the Autobot's back pocket are not what I was hoping to hear, least of all the addition of that Shoto Todoroki boy to their ranks as well. He took a deep breath, settling himself before addressing his general again. Unacronus, I believe it's time that we set some plans into motion. The Autobots you face have now won one victory too many. On the screen before him, Unacronus bowed in respect. I completely agree, my lord. I know that the cons here can be capable and competent in their respective fields, but, not under Starscream's leadership. Just then, a certain sound was heard from behind the general, making him turn around and scoff. HMPH, speak of the fallen. Here he comes. Megatron raised his chin as Starscream and Skybite hobbled into frame, the latter more than the former. Starscream was still quite significantly injured, that was to be sure, but Skybite made sure to keep himself low, as if hoping that Megatron wouldn't notice him at first. But, of course, that didn't work. So, the Decepticon leader glanced between the two, but focused more on the Seeker. Care to explain? 
There was a short silence that followed, but Skybite was the first to try and explain. L Lord Megatron, I. Ah, ah, I will address you later, Skybite. When I am ready. Narrowing his optics at his second in command, he continued, I want to hear from Starscream first. Starscream gulped nervously, knowing exactly what was coming. However, he also knew that he may get off easier if he did one of the things he detested most. It disgusted him to do it, but at the moment, he had no choice. He had to be honest. Lord Megatron, the failure of this mission is mine, and mine alone. Starscream lowered his head to his leader, holding back the urge to bite his tongue. I allowed my emotions to get the better of me and cloud my judgment as field commander as a result. The entire thing fell apart from there. My troops are now all incapacitated because of my failure to coordinate the battle properly. A surprisingly upfront answer, Starscream. Megatron spoke. I am impressed that you are so forthcoming with your failure, all the same, though, his glare didn't let up. However, I'm certain that you know what I'm going to say next, correct? The away team is coming, aren't they? Starscream winced. I just got through discussing the matter with Unicronus. Megatron affirmed. I will be sending them as soon as they are finished with their current operation. He leaned forward, making sure his intentions were clear, and Starscream, it would be in everybody's interest if you stepped down from your commanding position. The Seeker's expression fell at the news almost instantly. Be but Lord Megatron, I. But Megatron raised his hand, cutting Starscream off. I do not know what has changed in you, Starscream, but while you were still here on Cybertron, you were an effective air commander. I've seen you lead Seekers into battles where you easily overwhelmed the Autobot resistances, and yet now, you can barely hold together a small battalion of Decepticons. He shook his head disappointedly. Needless to say, I am not impressed. I do not know if it's complacency or your own ego getting in the way, but perhaps it would do you better if you were following rather than leading. Unicronus wore a satisfied grin at that, chuckling at Starscream's stunned face. Hee hee, I couldn't agree more, Lord Megatron. Starscream, effective immediately, you're gonna be. General, I wasn't finished yet, Megatron asserted, which caught both Unicronus and Starscream off guard. I will be sending the away team, however, if you can achieve some significant victory in the time that it takes them to get there, Starscream, I will allow you to keep your place as co-commander of the dark side. A gasp escaped Starscream's throat and he bowed to Megatron, clasping his hands together in gratitude. Ah, Lord Megatron, thank you. I assure you, this chance will not be squandered. What? Unicronus rounded about to his leader, imploring him to reconsider. L Lord Megatron, what is this? You've already given Starscream so many chances. Why continue to? Wham! Silence. Megatron slammed his fist against the armrest of his chair, making Unicronus and the others flinch. Unicronus, you know just as much as I do that Viacons are expendable, yes. The general silently nodded. Well, you should also know that Seekers are not. AI know that a capable Seeker is invaluable to the Decepticon cause. After all, we pride our aerial superiority over almost everything else. I will not do away with a Seeker, even Starscream, unless they can prove that they are not complete failures. He set his sights back to his second in command. However, this will be your final chance, Starscream. See that it does not go to waste. And I expect significant improvement in your team management in the future. Understood. Despite the Unadel factors, Starscream knew that he couldn't afford to screw this up. He bowed to Megatron once more. It shall be done, my lord. Excellent. Now, Megatron's attention went squarely to Skybite, who visibly flinched a little. Skybite, care to explain why you chose to lie to me? M. Megatron, I. Excuse me, lord. Lord Megatron. Skybite hastily corrected, realizing that this was not a moment between friends. I sincerely apologize for my blatant dishonesty. I, I simply did not want you to think any less of me. Knowing that I hadn't defeated Jetfire and was instead chased around the galaxy by him for all these millennia, it's disgraceful and embarrassing to think about, especially knowing you erected a statue in my honor. He hung his head in shame. I am no Decepticon hero, I am a fraud. A charlatan. A shrug was all Megatron had to offer. Perhaps that is true, but I hope you realize that I was genuinely happy to see you alive after so long, Skybite. His words made the Predacon snap his head up in shock. 
I was only disappointed that you chose to lie to my face. If you had been honest from the start, we wouldn't be having this discussion right now. Skybite clenched his teeth in frustration. You must be furious at me, then. But Megatron shook his head. Oh, not at all. In the end, your plan to acquire the Energon was sound, but it was hampered by several factors outside of your control. He began counting them on his fingers, Jetfire's arrival, more additions to the Autobots, human allies, he spared Starscream a glance, the sheer ineptitude on display. The only response from the Seeker was a low grumble before he continued. Your plan had merit, Sky Bite, and I would hope you keep providing this team with your skills. But keep in mind, Megatron leaned closer to the screen. Should you lie to me again, I will not be so forgiving next time. Oh of course, Lord Megatron. Skybite accepted the terms. I shall continue to aid this team in whatever way I can. And I promise you, from one friend to another, no more lies. Good to hear. Now, if you'll all excuse me, I have some calls to make. And remember, I expect results next time. Megatron out. Reaching for the control panel, Megatron pressed a button and cut off the communication, letting out a deep sigh. At what point should I just throw pretense out the window and go to that planet myself, something to ponder later. Typing in a new code into the console, he put in a request for his next contact. You've reached Decepticon Communications, Reflector speaking, came a trio of perfectly in sync voices over the line. What can we do for you, Lord Megatron? Reflector, make this an urgent transmission. Megatron commanded, put me through, to Soundwave. And it's the end of Season 2 Part 31 of this what if, I hope you guys like it, don't forget to subscribe, leave a comment down below and subscribe to the channel.